Okay, welcome and thank you for uh, being here today for our 2022 Pepperdine Grazia Dio Most Funnable Companies Showcase event. Uh, my name is Craig Everett. I'm a finance professor here at the Grazia Dio School, also the executive director of the Most Funnable Companies competition, and I will be your host today as we unveil our fifth annual uh, winners of the Most Funnable Companies competition. So we're very excited to welcome you back to the Malibu campus for this event. Last two years, we've been virtual only, uh, so it's really great to be back here in person. Uh, and it's a magical thing when we can put the uh, investors and the startup founders in the same room. Uh, so this is, a, this is a great thing for us. The virtual events that we've done for the past couple of years, they were a challenge, but we actually learned a lot from that that process. Uh, so this is the fifth time we've done this competition. First two years were in person, second two years were virtual, but doing the virtual event taught us how to reach a much broader audience. So we can only fit like 250, 300 people in this room, um, but our virtual events the last, two, the last two years reached thousands of people. And so we're doing a hybrid of that today. So we're, we're back in person, sorry, have to, usually I'm used to a microphone being here, not here, so I'll have to watch this left hand, so put it back here. Uh, I tend to talk with my hands. So this year, we're doing a live stream simultaneously with this in-person event. So I'd like to particularly welcome our virtual audience, our live stream audience that's out there all over the world. Um, and uh, welcome, we're honored to have you watching the event and hope you uh, get as much out of it and, and uh, especially get exposed to these fantastic 16 companies. So what we're gonna to do today, we have a great event planned for you, and we're gonna start by introducing our distinguished guests who have uh, generally su generously supported this competition uh, over the years and continue to do so today, and, uh, and are here to join us in this, this celebration. So um, because of our virtual uh, audience, so the camera's right back there at the back of the room, um, so as our distinguished guests are mentioned, if you could just kind of swivel in your chairs and wave to the camera, or uh, I mean, you can do a regular wave like this, you can do a, you know, a royal parade wave, <laughs> you can do just a, what's up? So just turn around so the audience around the world can actually see who you are, and that would be fantastic. So the uh, first and foremost, uh, we'd like to, to welcome, um, with our sincerest gratitude, uh, Will and Carrie Singleton uh, from the Singleton Foundation for Financial Literacy uh, and Entrepreneurship. So they're right here, so wave to the camera. Um, very grateful to have them here and have their support. Uh, as an aside, um, if you haven't done so already, and you probably haven't, we have a media room um, that's, if you go out the, the doors in the back and out to the courtyard, there's a room to the right, which is the media room, and that's set up so that you know, anybody here can stop by, give impressions, tell their story, uh, whatever the, uh, Ryan promises that it'll make you look really good. Uh, so uh, please stop by the media room at some point today and just, uh, uh, you know, just give, your, give your feedback, give your insights, tell your story, uh, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, the crew is there and waiting um, to, to capture you on, uh, on, uh, on video. And so wh whether you're a founder, an investor, or service provider, um, in the Pepperdine community, please stop by there. Um, okay, so uh, next distinguished guest. Uh, this is a, a, the, a board member of the Grazie Dio board, the co-chair of entrepreneurship and family business committee, uh, Vince uh, Machpart. <laughs> We're also very pleased to welcome Deborah Crown, who's the incoming 10th dean of the Grazie Dio Business School. And very fortunate to have with us today our keynote speaker and Grazie Dio alumna, uh, Kim Folsom, founder and CEO of Founders First Capital Partners. <laughs> <There's Kim. laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay, so at uh, this time I'd also like to recognize our platinum sponsors. Um, so the Singleton Foundation is the, the title sponsor, the platinum sponsors are CFO Plans, Start Engine, 
TVA and Wealth Teams Alliance. And we look forward to introducing all of you and their teams throughout the program. We also want to recognize Jim Kasperi and Elliot Reef. Uh, Jim's an alumnus, and uh, uh, they are uh, from the, the Venture Alliance, and they're responsible for the intellectual property that, uh, that powers this program. <laughs> and thanks to all of uh, our alumni founders, investors, supporters for returning to your school today. Thank you. And of course, most of all, uh, we're excited to introduce you to the 16 founding teams of the 2022 Most Fundable Companies list. <laughs> so every year for this past five years, uh, the Most Fundable Companies programs, uh, program serves as a free resource to thousands of startups, and it's focused on investor due diligence. We're not a pitch competition. So, uh, our goal is to walk these startups through a very rigorous program that uh, really does a deep dive and is really a due diligence co competition. So our goal essentially is to make this process as painful as possible <laughs> to, the, uh, to the startup founders. And probably a lot of you can nod your heads like, yeah, that was, that was really painful. Uh, because we want it to be a learning experience, particularly for those who haven't gone through the funding process before. Uh, they go through this and they get to know what kind of information, data, uh, what kind of questions that VCs will ask them before writing a check. So um, our main purpose is, is educational. We are a university. And so we want founders to come through this program. We had 4,000 come through this program this year. And so the 16 winners, that is awesome. You know, we love you and we're here to help you get funded and such. But, you know, the other 4,000 founders that went through this hopefully walked away with an educational experience where they will be more prepared next year uh, because of this experience to, to impress an investor. That's our goal here and that's the educational goal. But our goal today is to, and for the weeks that follow, is to help you winners of the competition this year uh, meet investors, and if, and assuming you're seeking funding, to get with the investors that are going to write you the checks. And so we really want to support you in that process. Okay, so um, your event program contains a lot of information about these companies. Uh, and for those of you online, a program will be emailed to you if it hasn't been already. So important to note that on our online page for this program, it's not only the 16 winners but all, of, all 70 of our semifinalists, because the name of this program is the most fundable companies. So there are other companies other than the 16 winners that are fundable, but you are the most fundable, and that's why you're here. <laughs> so that's a... Uh, <laughs> so there are a lot of investors in the room. That's awesome. Uh, definitely you know, write checks to the 16 companies that are here if they're, uh, they're, if they're within your investment thesis. Uh, but also please check out the website for the other ones that made it to the semifinals because there's a lot of great companies that didn't make this list and uh, they deserve your attention as well. Okay, uh, finally look for the most fundable companies list in Entrepreneur Magazine's December issue which hits newsstands and goes online on November 22nd. Okay, so a quick overview of the schedule today. After our special guests, uh, we'll jump right into the company presentations, followed by a fireside-style keynote um, with Dean Crown and Kim Folsom, and then we'll wrap up announcing the list winner categories. Okay, so we all know who the winners are. They're in the program. Uh, but what you don't know, and what's really fun, is that all these great companies know they've earned a spot on the list, but they don't know where they are on the list. So I say fun, that means fun for me. Um, <laughs> not necessarily for you. So uh, they don't know where they fall, so there's, there's a platinum, gold, silver, and bronze categories, and so all the companies will fit within one of those categories. Okay, so now let's moving on. Uh, I have the distinct honor to introduce you to our first special guest, uh, Carrie Singleton, uh, one of our sponsors, and the title sponsor. Uh, Carrie has had multiple careers in designing and building homes in small hotels, 
marketing, aerospace, and business leadership. She has been active on boards of local and state organizations in Arizona, Oregon, and California related to housing, mentoring, and the arts. In 2015, she and her husband, Will, established the Singleton Foundation for Financial Literacy and Entrepreneurship, and they are also very involved in supporting dementia research and other brain-related research. Please welcome Carrie Singleton. Thank you, Craig. I'll try to also avoid the mic here. Um, I noticed when I was getting ready up here that almost everybody was looking at their phone, right, checking their emails. Was anybody, raise your hand if you weren't doing that. <laughs> okay, I see like four hands. So when we started this, we tried to do what a lot of people try to do, which is to uh, encourage financial competence. Um, we try not to use the word financial literacy, even though it's in our name, because it kind of sounds like education. Uh, to do it, we started the way a lot of people do, which is putting the facts out and so forth and so on. We realized pretty quickly that we had to get the attention, particularly of millennials that were walking around like this, by using short form entertainment. We call it Million Stories Media, and millionstories.com is where you can find it. Now, most of the people in this room probably think you don't need that, so I'm not going to talk to you about financial competence. I'm suggesting you talk to your fellow coworkers, your employees, your kids, your parents, because 78% of the country, probably more now, um, are financially illiterate and are in debt, in tremendous debt. And the only way that's going to change is that they get comfortable talking about money. And so what our job is at our foundation is to break the taboo about talking about money. We do it with our million stories, that's short form entertainment, that's everything from Richard Sherman talking about adulting and getting in your face about it. Uh, we have uh, cooking shows, we have all, all sorts of different shows, you can check it out. We also have a game called Venture Valley that just launched. Uh, we had, it had uh, our first billionaire actually. So if you, or you're, not you, but you guys all know how to do this, but your kids, your coworkers, whatever, uh, wanted to learn how to run a business, this is an eSports style game, and we just ran it. Uh, I think we've had, what's the number, Shelly? How many, how many people Seven. have been playing it? Yeah, yeah about, about 50,000 50, 50, people have been playing this, right. Um, and on our Million Stories, we've had over 120 million engagements. So we're getting out there, but we really need your help to pass the word along, to get people to watch Million Stories, Play Venture Valley, and Ryan's going to talk about Slingshot, which is our, our newest uh, adventure. So I'm not going to take any of my few minutes to talk about that. Uh, so nobody in this room probably needs the information. I did it, Craig. <laughs> nobody <laughs> needs the information that we have, but we hope you'll share it. The only information that you might need, we discovered that almost 50% of all couples do not talk to their partner about financial stuff. I see some heads nodding. I, I, see, I see some heads nodding. So if that's of interest to you, we have a brand new show called Heartbroke, where couples actually got the, these are not actors, couples actually got the courage to raise their hand and work with a financial uh, therapist and do these shows. It's called Heartbroke, it's on Million Stories Channel, and if you're one of the people who is nodding their head um, during the break, check it out. It's on Million Stories. This is our brand, Million Stories, right here. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, for all that the foundation and you and Will do to make financial competence uh, reality for everyone, um, and especially what you're doing here to promote entrepreneurship and, and individual achievement. Okay, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next distinguished guest. Uh, he's a Pepperdine Grazie Dio's most distinguished alumnus um, and uh, is on the board, uh, Vince Montepart. Um, with a ba Vince's background is in technology, aerospace, transportation, logistics, real estate. I think that pretty much covers everything, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and he's a venture partner at Sway Ventures and principal at Global Capital Markets, which is an investment banking firm. 
where he's managed transactions and investments ranging from 40 million to 500 million. Um, as I mentioned, he's on the Grazadio Board of Visitors and co-chair of the Family Business and Entrepreneurship Committee, where he mentors uh, young entrepreneurs and executives. Please welcome Vince Montefiore. Thank, thank you, Craig, and, and welcome. And I want to say congratulations to the 16 companies. Even I don't know who won to, so <laughs> even though um, I've been uh, part of the organization. But before I talk a little bit about the board and, and what we're doing, um, um, a little bit about the most fundable companies. As I got involved with it a, a, a few years ago, as really the board uh, got, got involved with it, um, as you know, when I it, when it talk about uh, competitions and, and looking at companies, as Dr. Everett said, you know, far as the, uh, uh, you know, a pitch competition, this isn't one. Um, I got to spend time with uh, Jim Kasperi and get to understand the level, the depth that they go into in putting you all through the process. And, and it really struck to me because, you know, it doesn't, you know, what we look at from an investor standpoint is who you are, who your founding team is. What was that moment in your life that you wanted to go out and do this? What was that entrepreneur spirit? You know, I've had a few in, in, in my life, and one was right here at Pepperdine. Um, so that propelled me into my, my next company. So it's not, you're not going to see Jim Kasperi saying to you, you're dead to me. It's not a Shark Tank type uh, activity. Um, and uh, you're going to walk away with uh, a really understanding, not only about your company, but about you as an individual. Um, so uh, I, I think this is a, a, a well-rounded program. So congratulations uh, to where you're at. Um, a little bit about the, um, uh, the, the Board of Advisors for the Grazadia uh, uh, School. Uh, we've got about 35 alumni on the board, and our sole focus is for the students and, and, the, and the alumni um, that, that, that have graduated. And uh, I have the luxury of co-chairing the Entrepreneurship Committee, and part of our activity is coming back into the school, um, talking with students, um, and, uh, and, and also judging them on some of their competitions, and overall mentoring advice. I mean, we've done probably about over 50, talked to 50 students in, in mentoring, and after they graduate too, we still stay in contact with them. So that sole purpose is, is providing that and really making that a differentiation uh, for the school. Um, so what we want to do is we want to kind of take it to the next level. And a, a lot of the uh, conversations we've had and the one-on-ones we've had with, with the students to talk about how the funding you know, how do we get funding? You know, how do we prepare ourselves for funding? So what we're going to launch here is uh, what we're calling the Next Wave Entrepreneurship Corporation. Um, it is going to be an affiliation with, with the school, with the Grazia School. And um, it's going to be able to provide students, alumni, and also winners from most fundable companies with grants to, to your business. Um, it's going to be a 509A uh, uh, organization, which would allow from a tax deduction. And so we're going to be looking for alumni. We're going to be looking for corporations and institutions for those donations so we can make that uh, uh, grants to those students to get them off, off and, and running. So we're very excited about that. Um, you you'll certainly be hearing a lot more of that uh, in the coming months. And, um, uh, and you know, just... You know, we want to give back to the university and, and the students and help them with their ideas. Thank you. <laughs> so to share more about the entrepreneurship uh, program here, I'd like to introduce uh, from the Grazia School, Associate Dean Clemens Kowanski. Thank you, Vince. First off, I wanted to acknowledge, isn't this an amazing auditorium that you're in? The Wilburn Auditorium, isn't this amazing? So good afternoon, I'm Clemens Kovnatsky. I'm a finance professor and also the associate dean of the full-time programs here at Great City Business School. I'd like to take a moment to highlight some of the entrepreneurship programs that we have at Pepperdine, and I'd like you to explore some of them. So on the undergraduate level, we have various entrepreneurship programs um, within the Seaver College Business Division. The Caruso School of Law houses the Joffrey Palmer Startup Law Clinic, which provides free guidance and expertise to tech entrepreneurs preparing for startups formation 
initial capital investments, as well as in negotiating the legal and business environment terms of the investment. We'd like to thank the Palmer Center for Entrepreneurship and the Law and the Executive Director, David Feingold. Um, I saw him here, David, thank you for your support. At the Gradzidio Business School, we have an entrepreneurship concentration in our full-time MBA program, and it is led by our very own Larry Cox. I thought I saw him over there, Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship. And coming into almost 20 years of operations, we offer an E2B or Education to Business program, which is an MBA consulting project that we help with companies ranging from startups to Fortune 500 companies. Looking forward, we are expanding the integration of most vulnerable companies into our educational programs. So we're trying to build new programming and new classes associated and, and uh, uh, in tangent with the most vulnerable companies. Lastly, I'd like to highlight a future program that's in development, the Legacy Center for Family Business and Leadership, spearheaded by Grad City board member Frank Foster. I saw him somewhere in the audience earlier. Frank, thank you. Hunter Turbin, I think he's here too. Yeah, right there. And Professor Darren Good, he's right next to him as well. Thank you. They are establishing a world-class resource for families and their advisors as the first academic institution dedicated to research and academic programming under the, for the understanding, training, and development of next generation members of family businesses. And then lastly, speaking of world-class, it is now time to turn us over to Amy Wood, program manager of the Most Fundable Companies, who will kick off the list of winners in this competition. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Wood, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here to announce the 2022 Pepperdine Grazie Dio Most Fundable Companies. Yes. Yay. <laughs> Okay, Bridge, Bridge Therapeutics, I'm going to announce you in just a second. I don't see you over here getting mic'd up or teed up, so um, I'd like to just give you a heads up around that. And how the presentations are going to go is as follows. Uh, each company will present in alphabetical order based on the company name. So we're going to follow along with your programs, uh, the list in that order. Uh, so you can uh, keep an eye on who's, who's coming up next or keep an eye out for any company that you think is a, is a good potential investment for you. They, each company has five minutes, and we have our student crew members over here, right in front and center, who are going to be keeping time. And on that note, I'd just like to thank all the student volunteers who've been helping us today. They've been checking us in, taking photos. They're our social team and our timekeeper crew. So thank you, guys and gals. And I'd also like to note that all the presentations that you're seeing today and, and the entire event, for that matter, is being recorded. So um, if you would like to share or um, explore or revisit the company presentations, they are, will be available online on our website at the conclusion of the event today. And um, oh, one important note, too. After today, once that website launches, everyone can vote for your favorite most fundable companies. So you can vote for your top three. Craig mentioned it earlier. Um, keep an eye out. That voting will be open through October 24th. And um, lastly, Craig mentioned our purpose here is to help these companies get funded. And I'd just like to share one, one stat with you. And um, that is, since we launched in 2018, the Pepperdine Most Fundable Companies list winners have raised over $205 million. <laughs> I'm especially excited for this cohort because we know they're going to take that, that number to a whole new level that, um, that we haven't even imagined yet. So I'm so excited for them. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first startup. Welcome, Bridge Therapeutics. Let's go back. Here we go. Um, hi, I'm Tim Perra, president of Bridge Therapeutics. We are dedicated to tackle the opioid crisis. In particular, we look to free the treatment of pain from the risk of addiction. So freeing pain treatment from addiction can save thousands of lives and disrupt some multi-billion dollar markets where there's been little innovation in the last 20 years. So the big so what, why do we care? A million Americans have lost their lives to opioids since 2000. The majority of these people weren't trying to get high, at least not originally. No. 
They sought pain relief, but their meds let them down. Our strongest pain relievers have dangerous side effects. So, goodness gracious, what is going on here? Sorry, this is going ahead of time, it's on a little mind. Okay, so, oh, this is on a automatic going forward. We're gonna treat this problem um, with a drug called buprenorphine. So buprenorphine is a safe yet strong pain reliever. It can also be used to treat addiction. It's what's called a partial agonist or partial acting opioid. It behaves the same way as other, goodness, goodness gracious, it behaves the same way as other opioids for pain, but it blocks addiction and it counteracts depression. It was developed in the UK for pain, but brought to America for addiction. Our connection, I don't know how to stop this, I'm sorry. Um, our connection to this is through our chief science officer, who's done 16 buprenorphine trials, including some of the original ones. Buprenorphine has one main drawback in that you can't swallow it. It's not dangerous, it just doesn't do anything if you do, so it's given in the mouth, takes about 10 minutes to administer, which kind of sucks. It also causes mouth irritation. About a fifth of patients have mouth irritation all the way to losing teeth. We can fix the problem and make the drug more popular with a delivery technology called Zytus. Zytus is a freeze-dried gelatin, most popular in a version of Claritin called Claritin Ready Tabs. It, it stops, and I'm sorry about this, um, it stops the, it brings the delivery down to just three seconds. It also helps us build barriers to entry, goodness gracious. Sorry, gang. Um, this did not happen in the, uh, in the warm-up. So, it's used by top pharma companies so that we know that it's patented and trade secrets. It also reduces cost. Our pipeline includes both an addiction drug we call Bunels and two pain drugs, Bupono and Bucam. Bucam treats two types of pain, both from injury and from inflammation. In terms of commercializing, we've already licensed the delivery technology. We've conducted trials. This quarter we expect to do the only trial needed for FDA approvals, so we should be in sales roughly a year from now. So it's a short pathway to, to advance. When we look at our go-to-market strategies, we actually have two. And the reason being is the problem of addiction and its treatment while throughout the country is focused and it's concentrated primarily on the East Coast, it's treated in clinics, and it's treated by certified physicians. Meanwhile, for pain we need a national sales effort, so we need a big sales force there. We also want to lobby government to stop the process now that many insurers require patients fail on full agonist opioids, like fentanyl, oxycodone, before they're allowed to be reimbursed for buprenorphine, which is a much safer drug. So the markets we're attacking are big. I'm, I'm sorry, this is the only way I can get it to stop. Um, excuse me. It's about $40 billion in total market. That's split between addiction, about $6 billion, and the worst pain, about $30 billion split between chronic and acute pain. If we look at our financials, you can see that the numbers are robust. We will start sales um, next year. We should be up to about 800 million by 2026. And that's a tiny market share, that's 2%. Right, these markets are big. We have the potential, however, to be, have sales in the billions. And how do we get there? Safer scheduling. Buprenorphine is a class three drug, like codeine. All of the other opioids are class two, like oxycodone, Percocet, Vicodin. They're more dangerous, more subject to abuse. We can get government guidance. That's where CDC, FDA, advises governments, uh, companies to, uh, doctors to use their stronger drugs, their safer therapies. So quickly look at the, look at the team. We have a wide range of skills um, from big companies. So everything from drug approval and um, a range of marketing skills. So to summarize, um, we are taking a strong, safe drug. We're gonna make it easy to administer start with addiction, move into pain, and then innovate in the delivery of these drugs. So I thank you very much, I apologize for the slides, but I look forward to talking to you soon.
me to establish drone programs for them, but I can't do a thing about it because the technology they need doesn't exist yet. The technology needed is detect and avoid. Without it, the drone industry is dead in the water, with drones limited to flying within line of sight of a pilot. And when drones do fly beyond line of sight, collisions like this occur and will only scale as delivery drones take to the skies in the millions. To get a waiver to fly beyond line of sight, you need to show the FAA that you can detect and avoid aircraft four miles out, something no commercially available sensor can do. As a result, today, the odds of getting a waiver are one in 100. With those odds, you're better off building a drone business on lottery tickets. Multi-camera arrays are preferred because they're low weight and power requirements, but they have two fundamental flaws in their architecture. Each camera in the array is wide angle, meaning the resolution gets worse the farther you move away. And the fields of view between the cameras overlap, creating redundancy and a loss of range. At Circle, we've invented a breakthrough imaging technology that lets you have your cake and eat it too. The cameras in our multi-camera array can join to form a larger field with a common perspective, having no overlap, no redundancy, and no distortion. We can achieve image quality previously unimaginable. In 2020, when NASA became aware of our solution, they contracted with us to build a system that could meet the FAA's minimum requirements. We developed a camera using our novel lens technology that not just met the FAA's requirements, but more than doubled them for establishing a new record of eight mile range with a form factor that looks like something out of Star Trek. Because our optics have no overlap, it achieves nearly 100% sensor efficiency, meaning no resolution goes to waste. Other camera solutions on the market could perform well in any one metric when it comes to field of view, resolution, or real-time image capture. We are the only solution available that excels in all three. When our product hits shelves in 2024, there will be 15 million drones sold worldwide, of which 80% will need to fly beyond line of sight. At a $5,000 retail price, that represents a total addressable market of $60 billion. We're starting with the inspection and logistics market representing a $15 billion SAM. I was told in my college optics classes that it's impossible to build a camera that has both a wide field of view and no distortion. This is the team that's rewriting those textbooks. Our team draws on Rochester's rich history for advanced imaging technology. Our chief research officer has over 120 patents in digital imaging to his name, having led IMAX's R&D strategy. Our director of engineering knows what it takes to build a complex imaging system, having spun out his own optics prototyping company from Kodak Research Labs. But most important is our amazing work cultures, where employees feel free to be themselves and have fun as we work to revolutionize the camera industry. Our advisors and investors include the inventor of Google Street View, the founder of Red Digital Camera, and manufacturing partners throughout the optics ecosystem. To date, we've been awarded more than three and a half million in contracts from NASA, the Space Force, Air Force, NSF, and others, and we've received over two million investment to commercialize the technology. We're starting with panoramic cameras for drones and robotics because it represents the largest TAM, but we recognize significant opportunity for our technology in other industries, including media and entertainment, as well as aerospace and defense. Oh, and one more thing. If you like what you see, you can invest now for as little as $1,000 in our WeFunder campaign privately launching on Monday. Contact us through our website saying you heard about us through Pepperdine's Most Fundable for added perks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Hello, my name is Peter Farmakis, the CEO for Covira. Covira is a biotech company, a spin-off from the University of Chicago, and we are focused on making surgical site infections a thing of the past. Surgical site infections are an ongoing problem, a problem that many of us are familiar with. I'd like to introduce you to my sister, Tiffany, and yes, she did give me approval to use the photo and to uh, share the story with you. Uh, Tiffany was in an accident which shattered her right ankle. Uh, the orthopedic surgeon to rebuild her ankle was a successful surgery. Unfortunately, 45 days later, Tiffany was readmitted to the hospital for a second surgery to remove the surgical site infection. Surgical site infections present a huge burden. On average, 10 additional days in the hospital and more than $20,000 per incident. In total, surgical site infections cost the US healthcare system as much as 10 billion a year. And worse than that is surgical site infections increase your chance of dying by as much as 11%. More of the same is not working. The focus has been on preventing postoperative infections from the outside in, meaning more sterility, better surgical technique. Our approach is different. Covira is taking a novel biological approach, an inside out approach to help patients prepare for and prevent surgical site infections. Covira's proprietary solution, CS3, is a prescription medication that is mixed with water and taken three days prior to surgery and three days after surgery. CS3 coats the GI tract and stops bacteria migration and prevents surgical site infections. Covira has achieved a number of milestones, including securing intellectual property based on the work of Dr. John Alverdi, who's a world authority on the molecular basis of post-surgical infections. Covira received approval for one patent, and we have two additional patents pending. Dr. Alverdi raised $9.1 million of non-dilutive funding, primarily from the National Institute of Health. Earlier this year, Covira closed our first dilutive funding via a $1 million seed round, which was 500,000 oversubscribed. In April, Covira submitted a $2.3 million STTR fast track application to the NIH seed fund. And in July, we received a fundable score. The funding secured has allowed Covira to work to complete preclinical activities and transition to a clinical stage company by the end of 2023. What really sets Covira apart is our biologically sustainable strategy to prevent infections without killing them. If you look to the bottom of the screen, you'll see in the lower left traditional antibiotics that are therapeutic in nature, uh, reactive. And then if you look to the lower right, you'll see companies that have produced antibiotics in a proactive basis, but still all working to kill bacteria. Uh, if you go above the midline there in the upper left, there's new companies that are coming out to be more targeted and trying to do other things uh, than just killing the bacteria, but they're still working more in a, in a reacted, reactionary way, meaning if there's an infection, they're building something to fix it. Where Covira stands alone is we stand in the upper right-hand corner where we're proactive and we're trying to prevent something from happening. We're not killing the bacteria, we're actually collaborating with them. The U.S. total available market is 8.8 .8 billion. The U.S. conducts between 40 and 50 million surgeries per year. In our bottoms up modeling, we use 41.8 million surgeries in our calculation, times the cost for each prescription of CS3 at $210 to arrive at an $8.8 .8 .8 billion US market size or US market opportunity. Also, in working with the industry experts, we anticipate that we could achieve uh, peak year sales up to a 28% market share, which is a $2.5 billion opportunity for a Covira, so a $2.5 billion drug or market uh, opportunity for this product. So why Covira and why now? Uh, Medscape published the 2022 hospital safety grades and for the first time ever included post-operative sepsis and surgical site infections from colon surgeries in the measures. The World Health Organization said that antimicrobial resistance is a global health development threat and that antimicrobial resistance is a top 10 global public health threat facing humanity. The Center for Disease Control says that antimicrobial resistance is an urgent global, global health threat. Science published an article titled, The Post-Antibiotic Era is Here, stating in the article, 
Imagine a world where routine surgery or chemotherapy is considered too dangerous because there are no drugs to prevent or treat bacterial infections. And Nature published an article that commented on what is trending, stating that early investments are powering the ascent of microbiome therapeutics, which is what Covira has with CS3, a microbiome therapeutic. Quickly, I wanted to go through our team. Uh, on our team, Dr. John Alverdi, Chief Scientific Officer, preeminent surgeon, world leader in infection research, myself, CEO, uh, life science executive with J&J &J and Abbott. I've also been a part of four prior startups, uh, two in the biotech space, both were successful exits. And then from my experiences, I was able to bring on board our board, uh, Jaime Contreras and Brian Dior, both from Abbott Laboratories. Jaime ran a global division, and Brian was a CFO for the business. You'll see at the bottom uh, the other parties we have involved, scientific advisors, business advisors, business uh, partners, and key strategic partners. Uh, what we're looking to do here is planning a launch to raise a Series A round for 15 million in Q2 of 2023. Our goal is to deliver a 10X ROI for our investors. This funding will get us through phase two cl clinical trials by the middle of 2025. And we feel that anyone that has gone has to go into surgery for, uh, has enough trauma itself, worrying about healing from the surgery itself. We want to completely eradicate that and the potential that they can get an infection on top of what they've already been dealing with. We want to take away the risk of death and suffering from post-operative surgical site infections. We are focused on solving the problem and making surgical site infections a thing of the past. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good, the mic's on now. Awesome. Uh, so we uh, intersperse with the company presentations. We have uh, short presentations from, uh, from some of our sponsors. So uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce Ryan Groves from the Singleton Foundation. And also, just a reminder for, uh, for our other presenters today that we have timekeepers right up here, so please pay attention to them. And uh, you'll, uh, you'll see a one minute, if you're president, you'll see a one minute left uh, sign, then a 30 seconds le left sign, then a stop sign, and then if you go beyond that, they have my permission to throw the stop sign at you. <laughs> so, uh, so Ryan. Hey, hi, hello. Uh, my name is Ryan Groves. I'm the head of entrepreneurship for the Singleton Foundation, and and I'm Landon Phillips, head of innovation for the foundation. Uh, we are so glad to be here with you all today. Uh, if you're in this room, as we said earlier this morning, you're our heroes. Like this is what this is about. Will and Carrie started the Singleton Foundation uh, because they saw this gap. There is a game that's being played, uh, and all of us are a part of it. The problem is not a lot of people know that. Uh, and that's, that's a big deal, because if they don't know that there's a game that's being played, uh, not only will they not participate, but they won't even know how. They won't know the tools. They won't know the rules. And we'll miss out on something huge. Because when we create a founder, you don't just change that single person's life. A $100,000 company can change a life. A $500,000 company can change a family. A million dollar company, a street, a $10 million hood, a neighborhood, a city, so on and forth. forth. We are in the game of world building. This is not just about the cash that we generate, but it's a problem when people don't realize that. So how do we get them engaged? Today, uh, there's a lot of wonderful ideas being shared today. A lot of hard work's gone into this, but we need to not miss the big picture. These are ideas but it's all about the game that we're playing here together. And how do we do that well? Uh, in his 1920 graduation speech at Yale, which I'm sure you've all read, Sir John Mark Stimpleton said, you've all been sold half the truth. The vast majority of activity in a free market society is not competition, it's cooperation. So how do we increase access to the game? It's not about just the ideas. It's about this game that we're playing and how we play it together. So at the Singleton Foundation, we want to do exactly that by creating the content and the tools that change beliefs and behaviors that people have about themselves, their world, and how they interact and create value for one another. Um, and especially when it comes to entrepreneurship, how do we increase access to entrepreneurship and do so in a way that's valuable, um, that creates real efficacy, ownership, and can potentially not just change lives, but change the world and so to do that, we made something we'd love to share with you called Slingshot. So Slingshot in itself 
is the fastest, easiest way for anybody, regardless of educational background, socioeconomic status, to create, build, and share their next big business idea. We noticed that out there, especially among the people, a lot of the founders in this room right now, people who are several steps down the road on their entrepreneurial journey, there's plenty of tech options out there, right? You got your Intuits, you got your Adobe's, all that fun stuff. But there's not that much out there for that zero to one space for people who maybe don't even think of themselves as an entrepreneur. So we wanted to open the gates uh, to entrepreneurship as wide as possible and make this be available for anyone who has a good idea, about 20, 30 minutes of time, maybe while they're watching a Netflix episode, and just a pair of thumbs that they could do this entirely all on their phone uh, to be able to create uh, essentially a business plan that is generated for them after answering a handful of very easy and approachable questions. Uh, they're given this customized, shareable website. Uh, it's something it takes your idea from swimming around up here where it can't really do a lot of change in the world to actually living out there in the digital ether where you can share it, it becomes real, and can have the impact that it potentially can, can have. And so among, you know, that's great for that kind of crowd, right? For, for helping people who are maybe hesitant to dip their toe in the waters of entrepreneurship, but even for the people in this room now, even for the founders who probably have journals and notebooks filled to the brim with ideas of very esoteric problems that the world desperately needs solving, this is a fantastic innovation. It's the best thing since the back of the napkin, we like to say, for being a, a, a digital notebook for you to keep your ideas in an easy to, to locate space that's very, very shareable. So next time you are at one of these illustrious conferences or pitch competitions or what have you, and you bump elbows with someone in the elevator and you say, ah, you know what, I'm gl glad I heard you speak there. I have this great idea for preventing, you know, tortoise migration in the Galapagos. Fantastic. That's an, a problem I'm sure needs addressing. You may have it now shareable on your website. So that's what Slingshot is designed to do, get people excited about their ideas, see the value and merit in their own creativity, whether they want to go off and start a company or whether they just want to innovate inside their community or existing corporate infrastructures. Slingshot has something there for you. And, and that's the whole point. So we want everybody playing the game. Uh, and so speaking of playing games and being distracted by your phone that Carrie brought up earlier, if you all get out your phones right now, and I, I give you full permission to do this, or if you're on your computer, you can go to slingshot.io, and it's with a Y because we're clever, and that's a slingshot. Uh, so go to slingshot.io. We'd love to talk to you about it. We'd love to get in as many hands as possible because we want everybody playing the game. That will change the world. Thank you all so much. Oh, Carrie. And it's free. And it's free says Carrie Singleton. There you go. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ryan and, and Landon. Uh, next up is our next most fundable company, uh, which is EarthGrid. Thank you. This guy here. Hi, everybody. I'm Troy Helming. I'm the CEO and founder of EarthGrid. Um, happy to be here, honored to be here with such a great cohort. Uh, so a little bit about me, I'm a seasoned founder, four exits, including one unicorn and one soon-to-be unicorn. I also am an athlete, uh, competed four times on American Ninja Warrior, so uh, I keep, uh, keep myself in shape. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about infrastructure today, and I should say that my previous companies have pretty much all been in clean energy. EarthGrid is going to rapidly accelerate the proliferation of clean energy. The problems that we're trying to solve include the fact that overhead utilities are unreliable. They cause most of the fires in the West. And when our power goes out because the lines get knocked over from storms or whatever, it's not just our power. It's our internet, our cable, our, our Netflix. Everything can go down. It's, uh, it's not fun. Our infrastructure in this country is not great. We got a C minus grade recently by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Lucky to get that. It's usually a D or a D minus. And close to my heart, over 80% of all wind and solar projects that are trying to get built are abandoned after about three years of trying and a half a million dollars each. Why is that? It's because the transmission studies come back, takes two or three years to do those, and there's no capacity on the lines or the upgrade costs are so high, it kills the economics of the project, right? So our creaky old grid is the biggest impediment to the growth of renewable energy. We gotta fix that. Well, underground lines are nine times more reliable than, um, than overhead, but they're 20 times, up to 20 times more expensive. That's no excuse. Europe is 80% underground, and we're only 8%. Clearly, we have a lot of work to do, right? So we invented this plasma tunnel boring robot. Hopefully, this video will play when I click the button here in a moment. 
And this will give you an idea of this, uh, this crazy tech. And it's not gonna play. I guess that's because it's a PDF. Maybe let's try once more. Nope, and now it's stuck. Yeah, it's not gonna go forward. All right, so uh, that's too bad. But anyway, so imagine a uh, tractor with 10 lightsabers on the front, vaporizing all the rock and soil, <laughs> and a Mandalorian jetpack on the back, blowing out all the little bits of rock. My 15-year-old son helped me with that. Um, so <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, think of us, that tech, that crazy tech, uh, think of us, it, it enables underground real estate. That's what you can think of us like. So like a real estate developer will build a building, they'll either sell it or they'll own it and lease it out. We're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna build tunnels, we're either gonna sell it or lease it out. And I don't have time to go into the numbers, but you see at the bottom, they're quite good. Those are in thousands. We could sell a tunnel for $146 million if it's 100 kilometers long. Our margin on that is very good. It'll cost us 20 to 40 million uh, to make it, so very strong margins. But the boom, boom and badass are our products. Boom is build, own, operate, and maintain. If we own it and fill it up with utilities, it could generate 300 million a year for decades, so we'll be doing quite a bit of that. So our fundraising, we've raised 16 million thus far, $9 million from my family office, and then we closed a pre-seed round out earlier this year um, at a $30 million valuation. You see some of the VCs and angels that were in there. We're currently in a seed round, 60 million valuation, use of funds, almost all going into the TBRs, the tunnel boring robots. These are capital expensive equipment, right? We do have a due diligence report available. The market's huge. You know this already. I won't bore you this, but I'll just highlight that uh, the proliferation of 5G data centers and the electrification of everything. You know, we took out our natural gas furnace and our stove in our home, replaced it with electric. People are doing that. That's going to put a 3x demand on our grid, all this electricity demand. It's huge, and our, our creaky old green can't handle it. Uh, lots of uh, non-dilutive grant money available from the three bills that have recently been passed. Our advantages were way cheaper and way faster. Uh, by an order or two of magnitude. I've got a minute left, wonderful. And also on faster, it's not just our speed. And by the way, our speed, I'll point out that uh, 10 to 30 meters a day, the world record was 47 meters set by a tunnel boring machine in Turkey last year. They were very excited about that. And we're averaging about 1,000 meters a day. But it's not just that kind of speed. It's also permitting. You know it takes up to 20 years to get a new transmission line approved and built in this country because of all of the NIMBYs and bananas? Bananas build absolutely nothing anywhere, nowhere, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> we can go underground, do it a lot faster uh, in the interest of speed. Um, I'll skip. We've been testing for four years on all these different types of geologies. One of our mini patents is our geometry. Instead of a circle, like everybody else, we are a horseshoe shape. So that square bottom allows us to put racks in for multiple utilities. And if it's a larger tunnel of uh, eight meters, there is room for a two-lane highway or a big rail system. We have a signed contract uh, with the uh, gray there, e-commerce, a company called Pipe Dream Labs, moving our Amazon stuff through tubes at 100 miles an hour with robots. I got to wrap up. Um, we've been approved as a utility in 17 states. Means no one can say no as a utility. That's a really big deal. That's amazing traction. I'll skip this other than the, the far right, the Caterpillar thing. We're building that. Should be ready by the end of the year. We'll make a million a month with hard rock trenching. And then the tunnel boring robot below it should be ready next summer. Uh, amazing team, Nobel Prize winner, federal and state regulators, IPO in 2026, and that'll be a 50 to 100x return on your investment at our current valuation. That's it. It's a world changing tech. Help us change the world. Thanks. <laughs>
of the country. So at Genesis, we found a way to unlock unlimited sustainable water anywhere in the globe. So I'd like you to go through an exercise with me for just a minute because this technology is for all of us. This is about democratizing the world's water supply. It is often used to control people or cause harm to economies. So close your eyes for one second and imagine an area about the half of a basketball court. It's 29 by 29 by 29 feet. And within that cube, within that space of air, is your daily water needs for life, hygiene, and your well-being. And our goal as a company is to bring that to every person on Earth because that makes us better. Earth has provided us what we need, our essentials, and we need to take care of it. So the sustainability portion of this is extraordinary. Above us in the atmosphere is water equivalent to 37 and a half quadrillion tons. That's 12 repeating zeros. And if you want to put that in perspective, that's the amount of water that it would take to fill 75 times all of the lakes, rivers, and streams on the entire planet. And it's there right now. One cloud weighs approximately the same as a 747 jet. And so our goal is to use this sustainable water supply to do the things people need done. This is a uh, hydroscopic fluid. Essentially, it's a high uh, affinity for water vapor. And this is a 20-minute time lapse of a glass half empty becoming a glass half full. And what's interesting about this is it's very, very low energy. And so when we set out to address this problem, the mission of our company is to solve global water scarcity. We knew we had to take a different approach. Water scarcity is not solved because the technology package has not yet been put together yet. And so our approach to solving this is very different. And it starts with a liquid-based technology that is even better than nature. And so I'd like to just mention briefly some of the traction the company has had. I have to uh, really make a nod to an extraordinary team of partners and people that have been behind this. But uh, from a, uh, an interest standpoint in the economics, we just passed uh, a half a billion dollars of uh, LOIs and uh, uh, pending agreements. Um, expressed interest, I guess, is a better way to frame that. We support 17 of 17 of the sustainability development goals, which are very important to uh, stewardship of our world. And uh, we have won 11 national competitions on business and, um, uh, and technology. But the most important number on this slide is the number of nations who need this solution immediately. This is a GDP changing technology. And when you realize that water is the economic potential energy of a nation, you have to have it. And the nations in the world need this now. And so Genesis is going to start with a modest uh, and, uh, beachhead and a $27 billion uh, atmospheric water generation market, and soon be able to uh, serve a $2.5 trillion total addressable market across all segments, and then finally, Here's a little uh, anecdote, but it's true. This will be the largest growing sector of the economy over the next decade, growing to $5.1 trillion uh, in value. And this is just part of the team that's ready to uh, propel this forward into the market. Uh, we've had over $20 billion in assets um, annually managed, uh, over 80,000 people, and had exits on all continents. And so Genesis isn't just something on the back of a napkin. We have systems deployed now. We are, uh, we, many of those systems have been in operation for more than uh, three years. And uh, we're in the process of uh, moving systems into the marketplace uh, starting late next year. So we look forward to uh, taking this company forward with a global village of incredible partners and allies. We would like you, if you're interested to have a conversation with us, as of this event, we are opening up a round of fundraising and uh, we'd be very interested in having conversations with you about the details on that. And this is our mission, and it's gonna take all of us, and we're convinced we can do this together. Thank you. Okay, next up is Gravy Stack. All right, 
Can you guys hear me? All right. Got the clicker. My name is Scott, and I'm an entrepreneur that solves the biggest problems in the world. And some problems just have to be solved. There is no other option. And financial ignorance and financial literacy are some of the biggest problems. Financial competence are some of the biggest problems that we have to solve. Uh, you kind of gave my pitch so I could just sit down right now. <laughs> but don't worry, we're going to send millions of kids to Venture Valley. Uh, show of hands, who has kids? Grandkids, nieces or nephews? OK, most of you. So this is going to hit home. Financial literacy is not taught anywhere. I'm sorry to break the news. Uh, schools aren't teaching it. Teachers don't feel comfortable with it. Uh, banks, we love them. They're not teaching it because kids don't have money for them to make money off of, and parents don't have a roadmap. We surveyed 1,000 parents, and the biggest thing they said is, we don't know what to teach in what order, even if our kids are going to listen. Okay? So that's what's literally caused this $22 trillion global debt crisis, $2 trillion student loan crisis, and 76% of your kids and grandkids are going to fail a basic financial literacy test at the age of 25. Okay? Uh, in fact, I brought these with me. This is what you can buy on Amazon. The banking of the mathematics of banking and credit, the mathematics of housing and taxes, the mathematics of trades and professions, a bunch of white and black pieces of paper. You think kids are going to do this on a Saturday? No. OK. So that's why we created Gravy Stack. Gravy Stack is a bank account and a debit card for kids mixed with a game with hundreds of financial literacy missions that are mixed with mini games and real world challenges to make kids financially competent. That's Gravy Stack. And wait till you hear about the army of people behind us to build this, including the founder of Amazon Pay and Spin Master, the largest, one of the largest gaming companies for kids in the world. They're going to send 40 million kids our way. They just took up the entire bridge round a couple months ago. So my story. Uh, I started Apex Leadership Co., became the largest school fundraising franchise in America, 7 million kids across 40 states. Incredible company. I've loved it for the last 10 years. I started because my wife's a first grade teacher. We also launched business fairs all over the world for 50,000 kids, childrensbusinessfair.org. I am the go-to voice on how kids actually learn about money. And there's a big old gap. Financial literacy is the most critical skill and the life skills associated with it that is not being taught. Okay. So you guys understand this issue. Um, if you just give a kid a debit card, they, it's a weapon. <laughs> I don't have to say any more. So we create a bank that plays like a game to actually teach them. So we create a whole world inside of our bank account that teaches not just the flow of money, which I'll get to in a second, but it's a, it's a whole game. You're freeing the people of windfall from destruction against the greedy tyrant weasel, greedy mon and his henchmen, OK? Save, spend, share, earn, invest, protect, borrow, or the issues of borrowing. Create value in the skills and traits associated with learning. When kids finish our account, they never ask. Uh, within 30 days of starting a Gravy Stack account, our kids never ask mom and dad for money again. All right. So coming November 15th is our MVP. This is the bank. So it looks like a game. Because it's got to be fun. Gravy stack. Stack your gravy. That's the whole point, OK? We have cuss words, by the way. We don't say chores. We don't say business. We don't say sales. We don't say allowance. These, are, these make kids feel like homework. Kids learn in two ways. They learn by having fun, and they learn by doing in the real world. You think schools are teaching that? Very rarely. So this is what we have to do. We have to make it fun. So with our bank, we have the flow of money. We created and patented, we have 20 patents filed, by the way, to uh, protect everything related to gaming and banking as one. But we are basically creating a money machine where kids see the flow of money coming in from all their revenue streams and going out to their save, spend, and share jars. We have real investing, and we have real sharing to all 10 million nonprofits in North America through our accounts in Gravy Stack with real money. But it's not just a game, or it's not just a bank, it's a game. 100 missions plus, there's going to ultimately be thousands of missions because it's going to be kids teaching kids life skills after this inside of our world. But basically, they're not just playing mini games like the wants versus needs challenge or all these other things. They're actually doing real world missions. They're doing subscription hunts, grocery budget challenges, tax hunts. They're doing real investing challenges, family dinner budget challenges, plan the next family trip, all of those in the real world and bringing it back to the game. It's incredibly fun. Quick traction, 8.5 million raised. We've got 
four and a half to five star ratings from everybody. 3,300 affiliates are gonna launch us to 90 million people when we launch. We need 950,000 users uh, by the end of 2024. That's conservative for us because I have seven million alone that we're gonna get to. Uh, and it's about 100 million MRR. Uh, this is a huge opportunity in market. And uh, the last thing I'll say before I go is uh, we have an incredible team of people. We have founder of Amazon Pay, We've got Chad Willardson, who's in the room, best-selling author of Smart Not Spoiled for Families. We've got Spin Master, 40 million kids. They're going to throw them all our way. Top gamification specialists in the world, Yukai Chow, and 60 other strategic partners that are getting get this out to everybody. Last thing, we want you to make money. You're going to make great money with this investment. But the most important thing you all need to start thinking about is how we can make money matter. Okay, thank you, Scott. So next up uh, is another one of our sponsors, uh, Mike Lilly of CFO Plans. How's everyone doing? Can I get a round of applause for a 3D event? It's about time, right? <laughs> So it's, uh, it's an amazing thing to be here in front of you today. We had, uh, I've known Amy for four years, and I, I know that this has been a long time uh, coming, and now it's actually coming together. So uh, Gary is our founder and CEO. He's also a Pepperdine alum. Uh, he had his MBA from here, too. So it's really great to, uh, to be a part of this. Um, we, as a, as a firm, we do operational accounting, which is about as exciting as watching paint dry. But the important part about that is all 16 companies here today uh, obviously have very disruptive business models, but unfortunately with 87,000 new IRS agents, no one's more disruptive than the IRS. And so we kind of take the operational burden of uh, accounting and finance and so that you guys can actually focus on growing uh, sales, marketing, uh, and hiring the folks that you actually need to run your business. And so the way that we do that is we layer our accounting teams such that you have four accountants per each client that we work with. And so we actually commit to our clients that we'll get back to them uh, within 30 minutes over Slack, which is very unusual for accounting firm. The chief complaint and part of the motivation for me to join is poor response time. And so we help solve for that. Uh, the folks that we work with are ex big four. And so we don't make any concessions on who these people are. They're all very experienced. And then above all, uh, the, the revenue-based pricing, I think, is really unique, too. So when we have, uh, we're not an accounting firm that starts a, a clock on, you know, negotiations or, or work product. We actually don't put any restrictions on these people's time, too. And so uh, you can talk with them uh, as much or as little as you like. But uh, that's pretty much us in a nutshell. So again, you know, I'm really happy to be here and, and really excited for the opportunity. So thank you so much. Okay, next up, our next uh, most fundable company is Nevoice. Good afternoon. I'm Gustavo de Grave, co founder and CEO of Nevoice. I want you to imagine yourself with debilitating pain every day and very little help or solutions. That is what is happening to 100 million Americans suffering from knee pain today, and 33 million people from suffering from osteoarthritis. This is happening in part because the diagnostics options today are expensive, take time, and they are not always precise. Further, on the treatment options, the problem for doctors and patients is when and what to do with the, with the those want to use them, actually. So what do we do? We need to listen to our, to our bodies. We need to listen uh, because the body is always communicating with us. And unfortunately, either we don't have the wisdom or the tools to listen. And that's exactly what we have created. Me Voice is a simple but yet sophisticated device that in five minutes will give you a diagnosis of the cartilage on your knee. 
a, a score from zero to 100 where 100 is a perfect knee. We do this through a patented device that uses audio, vibration, and position centers, sensors. This way, knee voice score can be used by doctors, patients, to confirm the diagnosis and suggest uh, therapeutic uh, solutions, and most importantly, also to have monitoring. This idea was brought to us by the brilliance and uh, the vision of the, our co-founder, Dr. Carlos Leal, that since uh, his early years as a fellow at the uh, Harvard Medical School and NYU, has been researching uh, biomechanics of the knee, and specifically, the correlation of sounds and cartilage deterioration. But now a bit about our company. Uh, in our traction, the hardware and software side, we are ready to market and to scale. On the re re regulatory side, we are on track. We did a pre-submission early this year, and we are ready for a submission early next year. In the IP, we have already 12 patents granted, and three are still pending. Our, our revenue strategy is a simple one. It's a subscription model where there is no cost for the device with a monthly, bu monthly uh, bundle to the doctors. There is reimbursed codes that today can be used with our product. But this is just the beginning because uh, the, the knee is not the only joint that wants to be listened to. There are other joints that need to be listened to like uh, the hip, the, the elbows, the ankles that want to be listened, and that's why we are introducing ortho voices that we will become the gold standard for joint diagnosis. On the finance side, Nivoice has been able to attract $2 million uh, between uh, the funding from the, from the original founders and a seed round that uh, we closed back in November of last year. Now, I hope that uh, with the help of you, can, we can start working on a 5 million Series A, a round. The management team is a cohesive group, experts on their own, on their own, uh, on, on their own uh, technologies and, uh, and, and trade, and they have helped me uh, with two uh, exit, successful exits before. Nowadays, more and more me Western medicine is discovering and realizing that the body is the one that holds the answers. We just need to give, it a, give them a voice. That's why I would like to say that everybody has the right to move with confidence and pain-free, and that's what we want to bring them. Now, a, a little word from our, from our founder, co-founder. So finally, here it is, the knee voice, a uh, telefemoral cartilage auscultation device that provides precise information of cartilage damage. As simple and easy as it looks, it's really a sophisticated device, not a toy. For physicians, it fills the void of a dynamic test that provides previously unknown information and adds a lot to our practice and to our decisions. Different from CT scans or MRIs, it can be used repeatedly in the office and provides the highest customer satisfaction as doctors and patients can interact when doing the test and listening live to the sound from the knee. It does require physician interpretation to validate our own clinical perception and diagnosis, but knee voice is the perfect device for continuous monitoring of interventions, osteoarthritis progression, and in the future as a wearable and easy use appliance in sports performance and prevention. So welcome, Knee Voice. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next up is, uh, is Trubify. I said, Travis has not brought his guitar, so. I left that one out. <laughs> thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for having us here. On behalf of Trubify, I want to thank Pepperdine and the most fundable companies for this prestigious award. We have the clicker right here. Awesome. My name is Trevor Zinn. I'm a lifelong musician and part of the executive team here at Trubify. So what is Trubify? Trubify is an award-winning music streaming technology platform that's going to revolutionize a $66 billion music industry. 
We offer innovations in music streaming revenue for artists, and we provide intimate experiences between artists and fans. So why are we doing this? Troopify is a team of musicians. We are trying to solve the starving artist syndrome. So the problem is well known. Artists are not paid properly and fairly for their music. In the traditional sense, we have record labels, publishers, and the YouTubes and the Spotify's of the world that are not paying artists. If an artist does get signed, they're in that 1%, and they only make 10% of the revenue. Troopify is a solution where we offer all artists 80% of the revenue, and where they can begin monetizing the second they begin streaming. Now, Troopify, how we make money? We make money off of ad revenue, and we take 20% of the artist revenue. But this makes Troopify the perfect choice for musicians and also generates significant revenue for the platform. This is Olivia Fairbaugh. She's an independent artist based out of Nashville, Tennessee. She has a relatively small social media following, but she's already been able to generate $2,000 of income on Troopify. I have to tell you about this new app called Troopify. It's built by musicians for music lovers everywhere. It's unlike any other app out there. You get a front row seat to an engaging experience with your favorite up and coming artists, and it's dedicated to everything music. It's an awesome experience for both the viewer and the artist. To support artists like myself, all you have to do is watch and they get paid. So come find me on Troopify and let's hang out. Now Troopify has had early success because Artists like Olivia and music lovers all over the US believe in our mission. Our mission was founded by our, our CEO, Stevie Tishka. He regretfully cannot be here today as he's out of state on business, but I want to give you a little background into his story. Stevie was a lifelong musician who cut his teeth in the LA scene, gigged seven days a week, was a Motown recording artist, and was still a struggling musician. So unfortunately, he had to hang up his guitar like many musicians do. He quickly became a serial entrepreneur with two exits. He founded companies in financial technologies and music spaces. He has a current collective valuation of 620 million across companies. So Stevie took all of his energy and his passion and experience for the music world and he put it into a product where artists are going to get paid fairly. And from there, Trubify was born. Trubify is in our third year. We're experiencing exponential growth. We've grown 535% year to date. We have 80,000 users, we have 1,200 artists, and we have many brand partners. Our current consumer, our current blended consumer acquisition cost is an astonishing low $1.70 per user. We're in the midst of our Series A financing, raising $12 million. We will be, uh, we're estimated to be at a million users by the end of 2023 as we turn up our, uh, our user acquisition budgets. And we're also expanding globally with music partners in South America, um, the Caribbean and the UK. We already have a million dollar contract in place with emerging markets out of Africa. And not only does this expand Troopify's global presence, but it generates millions of dollars in recurring revenue over the next 24 months. Troopify's technology is disrupting the $66 billion music industry. It's because we're musicians ourselves. We understand exactly what artists need, and so we're implementing those features into the product. For instance, we're going to be creating a patent that's going to be coming out in the next year that's going to allow for fractional ownership of content between artists and fans. This is going to revolutionize the social media space and going to be a valuable, game-changing element for musicians to implement into their strategy. Not only do we have music lovers and musicians all over the US believing in us, we have some of industry's finest. Walter Cruttenden, founder of Acorns, Roth Capital, and the iBank of E-Trade, we have J.R. Robinson, the most recorded drummer in history, drummer for Madonna, Lady Gaga, and Michael Jackson. Our lead investor is the University of California Irvine's Cove Fund. So I know what you're going to say. Not another company that's claiming they're going to revolutionize the music industry. We've all heard this song before. But Troopify can because we have the right team, we have the right tech technology, and we have the right traction. So come join us, and let's change the future of music together. Thank you. Okay, next up is Lively Root Technologies. Thank you. I'd like to introduce you to Lively Root. Uh, uh, some of you refer to me as the plant man outside. My name is uh, John Ewing, and I'm chairman and co-founder of Lively Root Technologies. 
And having spent a lifetime in the horticultural industry, myself and our founding members have never been more excited about a business or the opportunity we have to revolutionize the $60 billion garden center industry. As a leading horticultural lifestyle brand, our mission is to become America's home garden center of the future. And we do this by providing live plants direct to your doorstep to every state in the country with the convenience found in other industries. So this industry, the garden center industry, is truly one of the few industries that has yet to meet the expectations of the modern consumer. Early on, while exploring this opportunity, I had a chance to uh, visit a Home Depot garden center and looked around, and I'll be darned if I wasn't the youngest person in the store. Younger people simply were not participating in our industry. So we're very pleased to see that our brand has caught the interest of a younger generation, the 18 to 34 year olds. <clears throat> now shipping plants in a box from San Diego to New York, for example, is no easy task. So our packaging is super important to us and we trust will lead to a very positive experience with our products. We uh, are differentiating ourselves from our competition in a number of ways. Uh, our fulfillment process is very unique. We also specialize in farm fresh plants. And what I mean by farm fresh plants is that we source them directly from the nurseries direct to your doorstep. We also aim to develop some very fun and exciting new technology that will help uh, our guests with their plant care and their overall plant journey. So we're now two and a half years into our business. Uh, we've been growing very fast and we're proud of the fact that we've maintained a, a super loyal following. Uh, we've built out a, a large database that's growing every day with over 250,000 email addresses so far. We've earned over 5 million site visits and we've processed over 125,000 orders to date. Now we're embarking on a $10 million Series A, and we uh, have a path to $100 million in revenue by uh, 2026. To achieve this exceptional growth, we will add a number of fulfillments, but we'll add appropriate staff, accelerate our marketing, uh, expand our subscription uh, and recurring growth opportunity, recurring revenue opportunities, add new technology, and then expand our product lines. Product line expansion is perhaps the best opportunity we have. Effectively, we can add $50 billion to our addressable, domestic addressable market. Uh, you see, we currently offer indoor plants. We'll be moving to patio and outdoor, and then many categories in betweens. Uh, those categories would include flowering trees and shrubs, uh, succulents, culinary plants, and uh, our B2B and gifting programs. Our B2B channel is actually exploding. Uh, we have large uh, corporate gifting orders going to many corporations across America. We're also realizing that live plant gifting is becoming a very responsible option to floral and cut flowers. So uh, those are two channels that I think we have a super opportunity in and may carve out opportunities within themselves. So as you can see, we are revolutionizing an industry that has yet to meet the expectations of the modern consumer. And indeed, we have uh, a unique and amazing opportunity to create the garden center of the future and reimagine the garden center industry. And it's safe to say that the reward will be significant. So if you have any interest in our offering or any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly and we appreciate the opportunity to share Lively Root with all of you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have a, a message from another one of our sponsors. Guy Baker from Wealth, Team, Wealth Teams Alliance is one of the members of our Most Fundable Companies Advisory Board. He could not be here together, uh, but instead we'll be sharing a recorded message. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Guy Baker and I'm a member of the 
most fundable companies advisory council and a platinum sponsor for today's program. I'd like to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about my firm, the Wealth Teams Alliance, and why I support entrepreneurship at Pepperdine. Every entrepreneur faces similar problems, how to manage their personal life while they dedicate hours to building a successful enterprise. The Wealth Teams Alliance provides financial coaching to these business owners who are just too busy being successful. And we do this by reducing taxes, increasing return, and helping them build an integrated wealth plan. I support the most fundable companies program here at Pepperdine because I believe in capitalism. Entrepreneurship is the lifeblood of capitalism and without it, America would never have been world leaders in technology, medicine, or any of the other thousands of ways business has made life better here in this world. I believe the inventive and creative business minds who start a company from a small kernel and grow it into amazing enterprises that support hundreds, maybe even thousands of homes, need the support of the academic and business community. Being a platinum sponsor is my small way of contributing to this incredible mission. Next up is NanoCan Therapeutics. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Broyles, and I am the CEO and founder of NanoCan Therapeutics Corporation. NanoCan is a biotechnology company that has the global exclusive license from Harvard's Dana-Farber Cancer Institute on what we believe is a breakthrough cancer technology. <clears throat> In the 1990s, when my father was diagnosed with lung cancer, the one thing that hunts me the most about that horrific ordeal was hearing the words, there's nothing we can do. So I wake up every single day laser focused on advancing NanoCan's proprietary drug delivery technology to make sure no other patient or family member ever hears those words again. The breakthrough of immunotherapy right around the time my dad got uh, lung cancer has been the biggest advance in cancer treatment in history. Keytruda and Opdivo have generated over $25 billion in sales last year alone. Yet current immunotherapies, all of them, only help about 20 to 25% of cancer patients. And that's largely due to high toxicity because you're giving it through IV, much like chemotherapy. And so that high toxicity blocks people from realizing the full benefits of immunotherapy until now. NanoCan, with its partners at, at Dana-Farber and Johns Hopkins, have developed a nanoparticle encapsulated smart technology. I'm going to call this a drone because what it actually does is deliver immunotherapy in micro doses, a very small amount, actually over a 21 day period, which actually has the impact of allowing the immune system to be trained on what the cancer actually looks like. And that's the innovation that the professor at Harvard Medical School came up with. We have had some amazing preclinical results at Dana-Farber. They've been curing animals of cancer there, of all types of cancer, for seven years. More importantly, when we treated these animals with this technology, um, we only treated a local tumor. All of them had metastatic cancer. And because of this training mechanism that we used, this slow release of immunotherapy, we actually were able to clear out metastatic spread in all of the animals. More important, after treating those animals with nests, none of them were able to be successfully reinfected with cancer, which demonstrated a sustained immunity of this technology. NanoCan has the global exclusive license from Dana-Farber for this technology. Over $7 million of US government funding went into Harvard to help develop it. NanoCan was recently awarded $3 million by NIH and NCI and including 2.4 million to help fund our phase one prostate cancer trial. We are targeting seven solid cancer uh, tumor types with a market size of $43 billion, and we continue to work with 
both Johns Hopkins and Dana-Farber on further product developments of this technology. We have a, a good, solid management team. Uh, I lead the team. I am actually a lawyer by training. I began my career at a, a law firm called Skadden Arps. I was the first black valedictorian in my university's 200-year history. Uh, I've been a successful entrepreneur, and I started investing in healthcare companies uh, uh, probably about five years after my dad died. I have Dr. Paul Nguyen, who is at Dana-Farber and considered one of the top prostate cancer doctors in the world. Dr. Adam Schilling has actually done over seven cancer applications and clinical trials in the last decade. We have a world-class scientific advisory board and have most of the top cancer institutions in the world helping us in some way. Oxford, uh, Mayo Clinic, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, some of them have board members on our company. Some of them are going to work with our clinical trial. But we've assembled a great uh, team of advisors. NanoCan has accomplished a lot in our two and a half year history. We have, uh, we have raised nearly $3 million. We've had a pre-IND meeting with the FDA. We've began manufacturing the Nest technology already. We are ready to go on our phase one clinical trial for prostate cancer early next year. And we have received multiple NIH awards already. And um, let's see what else can I tell you about that? Yeah. So in summary, NanoCan has this patented drug delivery technology. And we hope uh, that it will actually be the breakthrough in cancer treatment that we've seen demonstrated in seven years of testing at this point in multiple institutions. So I do hope that I can have a discussion with some of you. I would love for some, some of you to come alongside of me here to help push this through so that we can actually give cancer patients a fighting chance. Thank you. OK, next up is Nicotech. All right, uh, I'm Steve Flaherty from Nicotech. Uh, we're out of Columbus, Ohio. So and today we're gonna talk about something that you probably all used to get here, um, and probably many of the roads that you drove on were not favorable. Uh, so uh, climate change, uh, climate crisis is really what we're in, um, and it's global. So, and then combining that with decaying infrastructure, the, the two bills that have just gone through help with that, but they're just a drop in the bucket of the $20 trillion uh, market um, for infrastructure. And so we are helping companies um, and contractors and governments be more sustainable with their infrastructure. So more sustainable materials, more sustainable equipment, and more sustainable practices. So the construction industry, if it were an industry, uh, it would, uh, or if it was a country, be the third most polluting country in the world. It's accountable for over one third of all greenhouse gases produced. So we partnered with the federal labs and we're helping out scale out commercial technology that was developed in the federal labs. Um, so working with the Army Corps of Engineers, working with the Air Force Civil Engineering Center. Uh, we've gotten seven contracts to date. That slide's actually out of date because we won three more this morning. Um, so we've gotten 10 Air Force contracts in the last two and a half years. Um, so Look at it as commercializing stuff out. Look at those as uh, kind of lottery tickets. They could be mega million contracts with the government, um, but at the minimum, we're seeing uh, lab research and commercial technologies come out of that, um, that funding method. So these are some of the technologies that we have with the, the Air Force, everything from robots fixing roads um, to uh, installation resiliency with rapid recovery, and then, of course, our materials side. And so we'll keep doing this with the Cyber Sitter dollars, uh, but we're also focused on the commercial market and getting that path to revenue on that side. And so next year we'll be launching our first two asphalt plants. These are a new way of making asphalt, um, so we partnered with a technology there that is going to be able to introduce rubber, recycled rubber, recycled polymer uh, into asphalt. So there are things that have been out there for decades, uh, polymer modified pavements existed. Uh, we're just um, enhancing that and we partnering with uh, some of the largest asphalt companies to put these on their facilities because they all recognize that sustainability is the future of infrastructure. And so these markets, um, as I mentioned, are measured in T's, not B's, so trillions, not billions. 
Um, and so this is just some of the capturing that we can do inside the US. So why now? Well, this is one of those few moments in time where industry, that's usually the associations are there to protect their members, so they're usually fighting against policy. And if you've noticed, everybody's kind of in alignment in this. So it's something that um, even down at the Asphalt Association Conference in San Antonio, it might as well have been called the Sustainability Conference. Um, they recognize that they need to move forward. There's mandates coming. And so how do we get out ahead of that without them getting steamrolled over? So we partnered with, uh, the, again, the federal labs. So uh, CRADA's Cooperative Research and Development Agreements with the Army Corps of Engineers, with the Air Force Civil Engineering Center, um, commercializing some of the technologies that they've developed, uh, and then pulled in academia. You can't do this without academia, great researchers. So that is basically our R&D wings. Um, so those are extensions of our offices. Um, and then we've got commercial partners, everything from uh, feed st feedstock suppliers all the way to the distributor. Uh, distributors and companies that are actually using the materials. Uh, so we've got a team that is made up of uh, entrepreneurs. Um, I myself spent almost two decades in the infrastructure market selling to the state, local, utility, governments, um, and uh, contractors. And then we've got people on our advisory board that have been to the dance before and not just have had a ticket, right? So uh, successful exits, uh, our finance guys raised over a billion and a half, eight, um, eight companies. Uh, six successful exits from that. IP, because it's a big part of what we do, and then uh, people that are building multi-million dollar paving companies. So uh, again, funded by uh, original AFWorks contracts, so we're up to 1.75 million there. We've got three phase ones that were issued today that we'll look to roll over to phase twos and continue that track record. And uh, look for a large exit to um, one of the uh, conglomerates that we are talking to. So uh, they're all publicly traded companies, so can't name anybody in particular. So there's a monopoly of them. Um, so we did uh, go out because I've got a lot of friends, family, and fans, as we call them. So we started a WeFunder. I've been involved with crowdfunding since it was an 11-page document. Um, so wanted to offer an opportunity to non-accredited investors. So we turned down all of our VC terms. Um, I'm happy to open those terms <laughs> up after this event because um, we've stayed non-dilutive till now. Um, and we'll be turning on the funding uh, to basically scale the, the business model that we've already put, put out. So, but you're happy to contribute to the WeFunder already out there. So thank you very much, and I hope you will help us build the future of sustainable infrastructure. Okay, next up is Omnivis. Omnivis. One in six people in this room is going to get a foodborne illness this year. Well, at Omnivis, we want that to be zero. I'm Catherine Clayton, the co-founder and CEO of Omnivis, and Omnivis is a biotechnology company that's developed an integrated platform to transform the speed, accuracy, and economics of pathogen detection anywhere in the world. What my team saw was that 48 million people in the United States get a foodborne illness every single year. And this leads to $17.6 billion in downstream healthcare costs just from what we eat. But while being deadly to people, it's also deadly to business. This is personal to me being from California, the salad bowl of America. $993 million are spent in litigation costs against farmers every single year from these outbreaks, where 45% revenue losses happen the year after an outbreak. Every single food recall is $10 million. So for small businesses, this can cause closures. The thing is, to test for these foodborne pathogens, we still send samples out to a lab, so we don't know for days what's going on. That means harvest goes out, people get sick. At Omnivis, we made a platform that can be used by anyone. No scientific education is needed to detect for foodborne pathogens in 30 minutes. We do this with our technology, particle diffusometry, which is patented and has been validated with thousands of tests across four different countries for many different types of pathogens. It's really easy to use. What somebody does is they go, they get a sample, and they fill it in our single-use disposable test kit that is specific for certain pathogens. After they fill it, they put it into our hardware platform. 30 minutes later, they get the result. What's great 
no connectivity is needed. But when somebody does get to connectivity again, it offloads to a cloud-based platform, and now food safety managers can see what is happening in the food safety process and where these pathogens are. So now they can evaluate risk for the first time, really hands-on. The Omnivis technology is a $3.6 billion opportunity when we just look at the United States, and we look at farms, and we look at packaging facilities. This doesn't include things like restaurants, grocery stores, water testing, and really our customer base already, while we're pre-commercialization, shows that we have so much broad implementation that we can do with our device. And we're the team that's doing this. I started this with my co-founders, who were my PhD advisors. And we've been working together for the last 10 years, first starting with that grad school education. Some of my co-founders are serial entrepreneurs in life sciences and in diagnostics. But we've also brought on our board of directors and our board of advisors, who have been VPs in assay development, quality, regulatory, IPO'd companies, also external manufacturing leads at pharmaceutical and med device companies as well. And together, we've raised $3.3 million in non-dilutive grants and awards to make our technology and vet it. But this leads to our next steps. While we do have a patented technology, we have more we're making in the background. And we want to be able to patent that too. With those purchase requests that we're getting in the door, we want to be able to manufacture our technology, get those devices out, bring on more contracts as well. But also, we need the team to be able to do that. We see Omnivis, though, not just for food safety. We have a way that we can mobilize the laboratory. We're starting with food safety. We see how this can work in healthcare for pathogen detection and in biotechnology development. We're mobilizing the lab. And with that, we want you to join us because we want to put the power of the lab in the palm of your hand. Thank you. Okay, next up is one of our gold sponsors. It's uh, Ron Munman from J.P. Morgan. Thanks. Well, I, uh, I feel like I owe everybody an apology because at this stage in the game, there isn't anything that I'm gonna say right now that's more impressive than what you've been hearing for the last hour. So um, I just wanna tell you that I'm a, uh, a 93 MBA alum of Pepperdine. Um, and working for J.P. Morgan, I essentially help the business owner um, retire, leave the business, transition. And my hope is for every one of you that are sitting here today that you'll get to that stage where you're so successful that you'll be in that position, that you'll be ready to do that. Um, but the reason why I'm here today and a part of the Wealth Council, I'm sorry, part of the Advisory Council is because I have a true love um, of entrepreneurship. And so I couldn't be more thankful and appreciative to be a part of all of this and the process, and I wish every one of you the best of luck moving forward. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we're down to our last four, and that's, again, this is alphabetical at this point. So. The, uh, this is not in any particular uh, order other than that. Uh, so next up is One Health Group. Hi, I'm Al DiRienzo, co-founder and president of One Health Group. We're really a uh, company that's focused on that intersection of human and animal health, right? If you think of infectious disease, seven out of every 10 that start in an animal make a leap to human. 70% of our chronic diseases impact animals. And so we're starting with animals first uh, via our product called Voice. It's a data acquisition data analytics platform. And it allows uh, us to collect data in a non-contact manner from any animal, even though you're gonna see a bunch of canines in this one. So what makes uh, medicine, you know, veterinary medicine so challenging compared to human medicine? Animals don't talk. That's why the product's called Voice. Right, and so they, there's inferences. They mask pain, they mask anxiety. It's, what they get in the uh, clinic is typically white coat hypertension, just like you get with uh, humans, and it's almost impossible to collect data remotely. And uh, so what we have is voice that collects, analyzes, and communicates context-based health data uh, via a non-contact sensor, very small, safe, ultra-wideband radar sensor that collects anatomical, functional, and physiologic information 
It communicates that to a mobile app that displays health uh, data and system data as well as alerts. And then we have a cloud-based dashboard that's uh, based on over a million hours of collected animal data in over 4,000 clinical settings. <clears throat> and so uh, you can see our first release here is in the black. Uh, these are the types of things that we're collecting in non-contact. So can you imagine getting blood pressure and not having to have a cuff on you or an arterial line or seeing uh, fluids in the lungs? We can do those types of things. Cardiac release will follow and the pulmonary release will follow that and we'll continue to grow that ecosystem. The beauty is this doesn't require new hardware. It's the same sensor. It's new algorithms, new machine learning algorithms, and new firmware. Uh, I have a testimonial from some vets on an earlier version here. With veterinary medicine, the dog can't talk. You can't ask them if they hurt or if they're too painful to do something. But with the data that Voice Pro offers us, we are now able to look further into, you know, really what do they feel. The nice thing about Voice Pro is they're making it easier uh, for us to do a good job. Better data drives better <laughs> medicine. And we know that better medicine drives better business. That's what Voice Pro does. It's amazing. So this is a little bit of an eye chart, but what this is really saying is that we fit with the veterinary workflow. Uh, we actually uh, enhance every single step of that workflow. We provide a new revenue stream for them, bring about better clinical outcomes, create, or, uh, create stickiness to the pet parent, or it could be a farmer or a clinical researcher. Uh, we help with the shortages uh, that exist within the uh, veterinary clinics, uh, which is going through severe pressure right now. So far, we have uh, 615K in sales through two test beds, one consumer, one um, uh, veterinary. We have over 70 patents already granted, 12 trademarks, another 20 patents pending. We already have a, a demand for 9,000 units, and we have a number of partnerships. Uh, referring to those partnerships, strategic partners uh, there on the left, they've invested 1.5 million, but they really extend the capabilities of One Health Group. Uh, we have letters of intent for over $5 million from uh, some of the companies that you see there, and we have a number of clinical and industry partners that have been uh, participating in the studies. Uh, global animal market sizes are quite huge. We play in every single mar animal market vertical as well as we will with human eventually. And uh, you can see the top number there is the, is the global number and the bottom is what our potential is. Uh, go to market, we're B2B, and uh, we were, we're initially targeting uh, veterinary practices, but in any form, telemedicine, GP, hospital, it doesn't make any difference. Go to market, uh, you know, we create awareness in a number of ways, uh, provide access through distribution and strategic providers, continue to grow uh, that ecosystem and continue to sustain it. Uh, future market verticals, this isn't in any particular order, but these are all the different uh, areas where we have a touch point. We've already done uh, uh, canines, equines, uh, we've done pigs, sheep, goats, rats, primates, humans. I mean, uh, so that's where a lot of the million hours comes from. Uh, for the vet, they pay $750 uh, uh, for a device, so one sensor, and then $25 a month to continue to have access to all the data. Uh, management team, we've released over 100 uh, medical products to solution. We've worked together for over 20 years. Uh, we have a world-class animal and human health uh, advisory board. Uh, co competition is really sort of non-existent when it comes to the breadth and depth of things that we can do, again, especially in a non-contact uh, manner. We've personally put in about $3.8 million. Uh, we did our first seed in uh, 2021. Uh, in August, uh, we still have a bridge, about a million left on our bridge, and we go to a Series A that gets us to self-sustainability. So this just says, aren't we awesome? Invest in us. And then if you'd like, please check out our website and, uh, or email us. We'd love for you to come by our table as well. Thank you. Okay, next up is Uli Beauty. So... 20 years ago, I woke up and said, enough to chemical relaxers and weekly roller sets at the hair salon. I wanted to wear my hair just the way it grows out of my head. My name is Jessica Pritchett, and I'm the founder and CEO of Uli, a clean, direct-to-consumer, unisex locks hair care brand disrupting the $2.51 billion black hair industry. But first, what are locks? They are not braids. They are locks. These are locks. 
Locks are Afro-textured, hair strands coiled around themselves into fused units. Everyone from Associate Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson and Haley Bailey, our new Ariel in Disney's The Little Mermaid, to rapper Snoop Dogg and Nas wear locked hair. But here's the problem. There are almost 200 million black people globally that could rock this hairstyle but may resist due to lack of dedicated products that won't damage their hair. So Uli is the clean solution. We are black women owned and founded, sustainable, plant-based, no additives, and it's formulated for locks. We are Leaping Bunny approved. We don't test on animals. We invest in our customers' communities, and we are made in the US. So mainstream, traditional, and black hair brands have ignored this niche hair segment, and Uli stands out by being a hyper-focused innovator. Uli has three direct comp competitors which don't match up for various reasons, such as formulation, sustainability, some are made at home, and some are not made in the US. So almost 500 million was spent by black Americans on shampoos, stylers, oils, and gels alone in 2019. The locks category has a lot of white space and the future is bright and profitable for Uli. So our business model is as of uh, August 2022, the majority of our business is direct to consumer. However, we expect to cross the $1 million mark by the end of this year. Those are some of our retail distribution partners and the ones with the asterisks we'll be launching in 2023 in Sally's in Southern Africa, as well as the United States military PX system. Uli acquires customers at scale by distilling culturally relevant content with an omni-channel approach. Celebrities, influencers, and black culture are delivered through mobile, email, social media, and targeted ads, and it has really helped our sales grow exponentially. Uli launched right after the COVID-19 pandemic hit New York City in 2019. We project to cross over $200 million mark within five years by adding a kid's line, scalp treatments, vitamins, as well as a bath and body and fragrance to our product mix. So traction, Uli is 100% bootstrap by me. We are an award-winning brand with lifetime revenue sitting at 775,000. Our average cart value is $90. Our customer acquisition cost is $12.51. 40% of our customers are men, and our customers order four times a year. So our customers rave about our products. Our retention rate steadily climbed to 39% by, by now, 2022. And we did that through carefully timed emails and SMS marketing. Our funnel is pretty crazy. So about me, I'm a classically trained violinist, I'm West Indian, I'm Afro-Latina, I'm a Marvel Comics nerd, and I love a good iced coffee. But more importantly, I'm the best to lead Uli because I worked in the sales and legal sides of consumer packaged goods in the entertainment tech industries for over 20 years before starting Uli. I have an MBA, I have a strong background in understanding the black consumer, and I'm a reformed beauty product junkie. So Uli is raising a $1 million safe and capital to scale quickly. With funding, Uli will increase its revenue to $8 million or more by 2023, hire a global sales director, rebrand to reflect our growing unisex consumer base, and continue to feed our go-to market strategy funnel. We are in various stages of discussions with many angel investors, and as of today, our round is still open. So exit strategy. Uh, we see an acquisi uh, acquisition from multiple uh, opportunities as our best exit strategy. Uh, many high-performing black hair brands have been acquired by conglomerates over the past 10 years, Unilever, P&G, Wella. Um, Uli is a proven concept, and the Crown Act of 2021 allows more people to wear their hair like mine in a work environment without repercussions. And further, the US military, which is 44% black, now allows locks as an approved hairstyle of all five branches of the military. And Uli has a thriving international customer. An IPO is not probable, but possible, but an option nonetheless. And if you want to join me in making Uli the one-stop shop for locks, I would love to speak with you. My contact information is here. Thank you.
Next up, Veloce Energy. Hi, I'm Jeff Wolf, CEO and co-founder of Veloce Energy. And I've got to say I'm delighted and thrilled to be part of this cohort here today. What an amazing group of companies. What we're doing is we're making EV charging station infrastructure that's easier, faster, and cheaper, and adds in resilience and security in the same price. So the need for EV charging, if anybody drives an EV here, they know it, is growing exponentially. Half trillion dollars the auto OEMs are putting into electrification and nowhere near similar amounts of money into the EV charging infrastructure, plus the ways we build, construct, and connect that EV charging infrastructure simply don't allow it to scale at the rate needed. That gap of charging infrastructure has to be solved, and that's where we come in with an easier, faster, cheaper methodology. And importantly, the way we've designed our systems, we're actually eligible for higher government incentives as well. The uh, universal, modular software and hardware ecosystem infrastructure that we have serves across the entire EV sector, fleets, public charging, workforce, multifamily, all across the sectors, any size, any power level of charger, easier, faster, cheaper. The co-founding team, Randy Plumby has joined me here today. Myself, serial entrepreneur, founded the first uh, nationwide residential solar company, a little ahead of our time. Went on to lead Tritium Global EV Charger Manufacturer, based in Brisbane, led the Americas with Randy and Mark Yates. We found out about a lot of the problems in EV charging, we formed Veloce, we added Mike Schenk, who's designed hundreds of high power electronics products, and we're addressing the problems now. We've created new products before, created new markets before, and driven exponential growth. We've got a great team behind this as well. So what do we do? We put energy storage, purpose designed, urban designed, modular, scalable, parallelable energy storage on the EV charging stations. That lets us use a smaller utility connection, which is much cheaper and more quickly available, more broadly available, to power more charging. Then we take all the construction out of the ground. We eliminate the digging, and we put it overhead. But not just the power distribution, we also do communications distribution, and add the other services that are needed on site, like lighting, like cameras, wayfinding, communications, overhead, and all the systems are modular. So they're designed on the website, they're put together in the factory, they come out to the field, and they're installed, bolted together, rather than constructed. That means that they're easy to expand, and they're easy to remove on lease sites, open up a whole new opportunity. Overall, we can cut the cost by half, cut the OPEX considerably, and cut the time by a year, year and a half, two years for deployment. We're working through channels to bring the product to market, leading EV station developers for both public charging, multifamily charging, and fleet. We're also working with the EV charging manufacturers themselves in trying to create systems to deploy their chargers faster. We have pilots with Pioneer Power Systems. We have pilots pending in progress with ABB, Shoals Technologies, and Lightning eMotor Works. The same products we use for EV charging can also be used for building demand response peak mitigation. And we're working with some of the leaders in that space as well to apply product to buildings. Our revenue growth is, of course, hockey stick shaped, as all uh, uh, startups are, <laughs> right? However, we've actually done this before. We've got a team of professional hockey players in our management. And so we can do this quickly. We can also scale quickly because we're building modular systems. We're building a few products a lot of times. Our 25,000 square foot facility in Loveland, Colorado already has the capacity to build enough product to meet our 2023 revenue goals. Our pipeline already has the uh, uh, sales potential to meet that 2023 pipeline and beyond. We've raised six and a half million dollars previously. We're now raising a $10 million seed. We have a term sheet signed well into due diligence with a Japanese multinational we have a Texas-based institutional VC who has already invested in us and is going to co-lead the A. We've got $6 million committed from those two. 
We're looking for another four. I hope that you will come join us and help to accelerate the electrification of transportation. Thanks very much. And finally, Clubhouse. Hey everyone, I'm Hagen Walker. And I'm Anna Barker. And we're so excited to introduce you to our brand, Glow Pals. Our company, Glow, was started out of a classroom project while we were students at Mississippi State, where we patented a liquid activation technology. We first went to market by selling light up drink cubes to bars and restaurants throughout the United States, <clears throat> but that quickly changed. In 2017, a mom reached out to us. She had found one of our light up ice cubes in a restaurant took it home and put it in the bath for her son. It was the first time in months that little Bishop got in the bath without crying. See, Bishop has autism and also sensory processing disorder, and the light from our small light-up cube helped redirect his senses to something way more positive. His story ultimately led to our uh, pivot into the early childhood development space and allowed us to develop the Glow Pals. These are light-up sensory toys the little cubes can be placed in the water. They automatically light up and change colors. Or you can also place them in the back of these characters to bring the characters to life. And the cool thing is, when you drain the bath water or you take the cube out, it automatically turns off. We have uh, two um, patents as well as uh, nine trademarks. And this isn't a concept any longer. We actually have sold more than 3 million products to customers in 36 countries around the world. You can find Glow Pals in over 1,800 retailers throughout the US and Canada, including Nordstrom, Macy's, and Kohl's. Um, and the coolest thing to me is, since we launched the Glow Pal characters in 2019, uh, we've actually won a Top Sensory Toy Award every year since. Actually, two weeks ago, we won Top Sensory Toy of the Year for 2022 by Toy Insider. We've also been incredibly fortunate to be featured in a lot of articles, including a headline feature by the New York Times earlier this year. Uh, but honestly, that's not the coolest thing. The coolest thing is feedback from our own customers. This feedback is why we do what we do. It's to fulfill, uh, we fulfill a wonderful niche between sensory toys and educational products, and we've had great success with that thus far. The really remarkable part about the niche that he just mentioned is that we kind of found it organically. Um, as we began to grow and first started getting these products out across the country and then um, into those 36 other countries, um, with that growth came this tremendous amount of feedback from parents and caregivers, early childhood specialists, and they were detailing these creative applications they found to use the Glow Pals as a developmental tool or, in a th or as a therapeutic resource but also just kids wanting to use it outside of the bath to engage in imaginative play. This ended up being a pretty huge driving factor for us to continue to develop, to develop out the Glow Pals characters um, and really bring them to life with their own world. And we did make some friends along the way. Um, our background story and the influence of the autism community led us to our first licensing partnership with Sesame Workshops. So last year, we launched an exclusive line of Glow Pals featuring some of the most iconic uh, furry friends uh, on the street. Uh, but we were specifically highlighting Julia. She's the fourth one up here, and she is the first autistic Muppet from Sesame Street. This partnership kind of paved the way for our next strategic partnership, also through licensing, um, with another beloved and classic neighbor. Meet Daniel Tiger. He's the adorable little tiger cube who is bringing the Mr. Rogers message of kindness and empathy to uh, today's generation of children. These partnerships were an amazing experience, especially so early on for us, but what they really taught us was the value and um, how meaningful of an impact it could be to uh, really build out the Glow Pals character in the world. So with the character development, what we realized is that um, we need to focus not only on our existing product line expanding, but also on media development as well, where a kid can relate and be immersed in the Glow Pals world through digital content. So here's an example of how that can work hand in hand. 
uh, next week we're launching a new line of uh, non-slip adhesive bath stickers. They're ocean and they're uh, space themed. Pippa, one of the original five glow pals, she loves STEM and is fascinated by space travel. So the packaging actually expands out where she can guide you through our solar system and there's interactive activities um, that can teach kids about everything from how constellations form to cracking real Morse code. But the way to take that one step further is to have a digital immersive experience that parents and children can use as a resource for learning in the home and, uh, and introducing kids to these concepts in a way that they really understand and relate to. Here's a look at our uh, anticipated revenue growth over the next years. I'm going to be told to stop. Here's a, uh, anticipated revenue growth. Thank you guys for having us today. We appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Well, there you have it. The 2022 uh, Pepperdine Grazie Dio Most Fundable Companies. Okay, so stay tuned because we're going to be announcing our awards for the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze categories. Uh, don't forget to vote for your favorite uh, companies through uh, now through October 24th. So while we're transitioning to the uh, to the keynote fireside uh, presentation, let me take a couple of more moments to uh, to to acknowledge our sponsors. So. Um, We'd like to formally acknowledge and send a special waves thank you to two Grazie Dio alums. Uh, thanks again to Ron Munman of JP Morgan as our event gold sponsor and to Garrett Gilbertson of Startup Mavericks as a silver sponsor along with the Palmer Center for Entrepreneurship and the Law. Our event resource partners uh, are Diversified Professional Coaching, uh, the LA Venture Association, LAVA, um, Mikoy Communications, Net Capital, Scherzer International, SoCal IP Law Group, and Stubbs, Alderton, and Markleys. Um, a special thank you, especially to Scott, Scott Alderton, who I know is here today, who has served as a showcase panelist uh, previously and as a Grazie Dio Senior Fellow in Entrepreneurship. Uh, it's great to have you back with us today, Scott. Where are you, buddy? Uh, with the lights, I can't really see very well. Um, we'd also like to thank all of our in-kind uh, premium sponsors. Um, we'd like to thank uh, Steve, uh, Steve Lehman of Business Rockstars and Co-Founders Lab. He's been with us since the very beginning. Uh, Steve's support of entrepreneurship at the Grazie Dio School also spans many years, having served as a senior fellow in entrepreneurship here. Uh, also. Big thank you to SoCal Caretsu Forum Chapter President and Most Fundable Companies Advisory Council member, Connie Harrell, for numerous col uh, collaborations and help with uh, this program. Um, Connie will actually be featuring some of our wi uh, list winners at her upcoming investment forums. Okay, and uh, also keep an eye out for some of our list winners at Pismo Ventures National B2X Startup Symposium on November 17th. Thank you to JJ Risha for highlighting our most fundable companies to facilitate their funding for a third consecutive year. And uh, they have uh, hooked our startup, uh, startup founders up with, uh, with some great funding sources. Um, so, the in kind. Uh, so we're successful through the support of many. Uh, our development partner for the software uh, behind our process is Michael Cooper of Dataflow Designs. I think he's over there. <laughs> also, um, the uh, uh, the f hmm, interesting uh, and the many for the many firms that provided discounted or pro bono, bono benefits directly to the winning companies, which are listed in the program. To all these incredible professionals and friends of Pepperdine Most Fundable Companies, thank you. Okay, so now I have the, the pleasure to introduce you to the incoming 10th Dean of the Grazie Dio Business School, uh, Deborah Crown.
An academic leader for nearly two decades, Dean Crown comes to Pepperdine Grazie Dio, having served as Dean of the Kramer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College and Professor of Management. As a former educator and AACSB reviewer, her research has been featured in many national media outlets, including CNN and the Wall Street Journal. She has received many awards for her influential leadership and dedication to social responsibility. Please welcome Dr. Deborah Crown. Okay. Excellent. So I hope everyone is enjoying the most fundable companies. I know that I am. And after two hours and 15 minutes, I'm going to kick this up a little bit. Because the first thing I wanted to do was really thank everyone. So would you guys mind like standing up? Do you want to stand up for a minute? So stand up. Let's give a round of applause to everyone who made this possible. I also want to thank the students and the faculty and staff, all of the supporters. I love having in the room the founders as well as investors. And so whether you're in this room with us or if you're joining us from around the globe, thank you for participating. And we are so fortunate because you've heard today just the grazie dio way and you've heard the investment in entrepreneurship. I'm going to tell you, kind of, Grazia Dio has four core values. And it's not going to surprise you at all that one of them is a pioneering spirit. I don't think that we would be here without that as a core value. But I was so taken when listening to these 16 companies that you really exhibit all four of these core values. So it's not just the pioneering spirit, but listening courage with compassion. Just listening to the stories of how your businesses got started. Integrity, always, and just that social responsibility that we heard from all of you. And the last, kind of this adage of take action today, not tomorrow. Those are four core values, and it was such a pleasure hearing the 16. Well, you also heard that for the most fundable companies, we've got goals and plans to expand the impact even further. And to do that, we need all of our partners, and one of our most important partners are our alumni. And so we are so fortunate to have Kim with us today, who is a treasured alum and is a rock star in this space. And so um, one of the things, I, we're going to talk about her company in just a minute, but I want to tell you just a couple of things about Kim. And I, I encourage you to go read her background. It's astounding. And I know you'll share with us some of the things that she's doing. But she serves on a number of boards. Um, she really is, and you're going to hear about her company, is a one of its kind. And so I'm going to do like a little teaser here, and then she's going to talk to us about it. One of the things, though, that all of you know as entrepreneurs, you have to have amazing stamina. Yes? Yep. Amazing stamina, almost to the point where people think that something might be wrong with you. <laughs> yes? OK. I'm going to share that while the rest of us were enjoying hearing these presentations from these fabulous companies, um, Kim was upstairs doing a plenary session for another organization. So please welcome Kim. Thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your story. And so the first thing I just want to ask you is I heard, so you can tell me if this is accurate, that you started your first company while you were a Pepperdine student? I did. And that you have gone on to launch seven companies. So tell us a little bit about when you were started with that first company. Did you see a pathway to seven companies? Or were you thinking this was just going to be a one-time <sighs> shot? Oh, my gosh. 
Um, first, let me say, I am so, this is, this is such a pinch me moment to come back here. This is, I was telling someone, this is my second time back on campus since graduation. And um, uh, Pepperdine was the place that helped unlock entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I am a software engineer by training. I graduated from San Diego State, and I was one of those people that wanted to be Bill Gates, like all the other guys that I went to uh, uh, undergraduate with. But it was at a time when the whole idea of seeing a woman leading a technical company did not exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I started undergraduate under the auspices of Title IX. I got in as a an athlete, and I had to fight to major, major in as, as an engineer, but I wanted to, you know, solve big problems like, you know, the guys I went to school with. And um, it was like, you know what, you should just be lucky you got to this point. And I was fortunate that I had, um, I call it, you know, Ken, uh, Ken and Kitty Capital that I grew up with. My dad was a Navy uh, officer who said, you can do anything. And so that was always the voice in my head that propelled me. And for eight years, I started working in what was the innovative technology, which was ATM systems, mm -hmm. and um, was trying to figure out how can I run something and couldn't, you know. And I realized that I had to go to graduate school to figure it out. And I thought, okay, um, Pepperdine had the executive education program and the full-time employment. So I was working full-time. I was a mom of a one-year-old, but I was like, I'm gonna go there, be able to focus on this. And my first class, these two guys launched a business. And this was in the crazy dot-com era. Okay. So, you know, I was, it was 95 that I got accepted. I did a firm it for a year. And they got a term sheet, and I just thought, oh my God. <laughs> If these guys could do it, I could. And so my second class is no when I launched. To those guys. Uh, I launched my <laughs> launched my first company was That's in so this, fun. but it was because I could not see a way to do it. It was not accessible. You know, in the ninety, in the you know, in the eighties, and I, there was not all this entrepreneurial stuff. But we had an assignment to launch a business, and it was here that it unlocked it for me. Um, and so I am so thankful for this university. So now, do you guys, did you catch, she did that while a student, while working with a one-year-old? Okay. Very, yes, yes, as you said, crazy, <laughs> that's it. Okay. So, so what were some of the lessons that you learned in that first venture? Oh my gosh, so many, um, so, so many. I mean, I started my first company in the 96, 97 era when couple other companies you may have heard of, Amazon, <laughs> Google, and you know, people are like, Amazon, oh my gosh, it's like, you know, books on the internet, what, you know? Um, and so <laughs> it's so much about, you know, perseverance and vision. Um, and, and the biggest thing that I use today and propelled me to what I do today is that I ended up having to have a different playbook mm -hmm. um, and not giving up. You know, um, be just because you don't see it does not mean it's not possible. Right. And, um, and, and being able to stretch out outside of your comfort zone to find people who are doing what you want to do. Those two guys right. in my class, it was just like, oh my gosh, they're doing what I want to do. So it's like, it's possible. Well, tell us about Founders First Capital Partners because that's just a perfect kind of segue into that. So start there, and then I've got a whole host oh, of follow-up sure. questions. Um, so um, after starting that first company, uh, which was called uh, Seminar Source, um, I ended up uh, raising capital was the most. I ended up raising twenty million um, in venture, but it was not until I was a profitable company that I raised my. Um, uh, money, even though my colleagues did had a different playbook that mm -hmm. they followed. Um, and I exited that company uh, and successfully sold it to another venture. But my investors had said, you know, you should consider being on the other side of the table because there's other women and, and people of color that you could help. And it was just like, are you kidding me? Do you know it took me eight years? <laughs> I mean, because at the end of that, I came back to Pepperdine to graduate because I was like, this is this helped me, you know, so much have that that resonance, and and so um, 
I eventually thought, you know what, gosh, and other people aren't, aren't helping more diverse companies mm -hmm. grow. Um, and so that was the impetus and recognizing that as a diverse founder. And I, I categorize diversity as a pretty big tent. Women, people of color, military veterans, and others in, in underrepresented communities that with the right resources, they can thrive. Mm -hmm. Many people would say, oh, Kim, you're a unicorn. It's like, I'm not. I am truly blessed. I am so blessed. And I can use those blessings to help others. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the role of mentoring in your company. That's very important. You know, I, I have a big responsibility with regards to, I mean, we are a platform that we consider us a social justice impact investing platform. On one side, we have an accelerator to teach mm -hmm. them how to do it. And, and the thing with, as a tech entrepreneur, there's some core DNA components which were so well represented in the companies you saw today. Mm -hmm. Recurring revenue, predictability, traction, all of those things are so core. But if you're running a mainstream business, those things are not as communicated as an expectation. And especially if you're an underrepresented founder, it's more like, oh my gosh, you're doing a business, good for you. You know, you're generating revenue, <laughs> good for you. But the, but the reality is there's so, so much that happens. Entrepreneurship, as you mentioned, is so critical. That unlocks the whole American dream, mm -hmm. be it you know, retirement, sending their kids to college, um, buying a home, and all those pieces. And so some of it is providing the know-how, connections, resources, mentorship, and advocacy, and amplification. Mm -hmm. We also, like a lot of tech um, uh, platforms, are a direct funder. Mm -hmm. um, we provide revenue-based financing, which is non-dilutive, if you ever watch the show Shark Tank. Um, that, it, some people think, oh my gosh, I just want to do this with equity. Having funded six companies with raising $30 million in equity, um, it's, the companies that have done well have not done it strictly with equity. Um, there's always a little bit of alternative capital because the more control that you have on having patient capital to have you test and all of those things, the more uh, successful you, you can have the outcomes. I mean, you look at like companies like Facebook and Amazon, they did not do and get to where they were by truly just doing equity. You have to have an integrated investment strategy. So as you've had this journey, what's one of the most challenging uh, times that you faced and how did you handle it? Um, gosh, many. Um, you know, I've gone through four, all those folks that in the pitch competition that we're talking about doing Series A, I've done four of them. Um, series A, Series B, Series C, you know, <laughs> all of those. And um, it's making certain you find the right investment partner. I mean, because it's like a marriage, you know, and you work together on having that shared vision. And with Founders First, we are not just trying to provide capital, but we want to do something that hasn't been done before with this whole inclusive economy we're trying to build. And so finding the right mm. partner is really important. And you know, it was three groups of people that I thought were going to partner with me to get to this point. Um, and you know, in the first group, I thought, yeah, we're, we're making this happen, and it didn't. And then the second group, and now the third, and the third group, and it worked out to be the best of all, you know, I mean, as one person told me, you know, my base of investors are like an NPR commercial. My lead investor is Rockefeller Foundation and CERNA and MacArthur Foundation, as well as other major family offices, because they have led the way with innovative finance. If I would have gotten hitched to those first group of people, I would not have had this, this opportunity, but that did not make it under any less stressful, mm -hmm. you know, going through that journey. So as you listened today, what advice would you give? Kind of our 16, and then I'm gonna go all the way since we've got people watching, kind of the 4,000 people who have put their hat into this ring. Some advice for them. Uh, it's a tough journey, but it's so worth it. I mean, from you know coming into my initial Pepperdine class as a 96 the class in the initial class uh, starting class of 96 but graduating in a class of 2000 <laughs> to it is so worth it 
it's going to take you four times as long and cost three times as much. Um, and I used to say that as a software engineer, I was actually just talking, saying this to my CTO two days ago. As an engineer, you are the most optimistic, you know, and you think anything's possible. But even more than that, entrepreneurs, anything's possible. And we always think optimistically about, you know, there's some way. And you, so you'll end up having to have that North Star vision of what success would look like. You don't have to recreate the wheel. There are people out there. The biggest thing you've got to be willing to do is ask for help and say that you don't know mm -hmm. and not give up hope. You know, because everybody likes the success story of when it works out. It's mm -hmm. just it always is never an overnight. Well, I do have to admit that I love that the first company was launched while you were a Pepperdine student. Mm -hmm. And so, sorry, I would not be a good dean <laughs> if I wasn't going to pitch while I'm sitting up here. And so I love the research that shows that it used to be that entrepreneurs didn't take the time to go to um, advanced, get advanced degrees. And I love the research that is showing. And you're oh such a gosh. good testament. Well, and the other I thing is cool. people think that all the entrepreneurs are the 20 something oh, people. I, I love that you brought that up. I was so glad to see yes. this group here. Yes. Because um, I will tell you, I mean, with what we've done at Founders First, we've worked with over 650 companies. The ones that have done the best are the people that came with lived experiences. Right. Generally, all the stories you heard, they're solving problems from lived experiences. That's what Founders First is to yes. me. You know, my journey that taken me eight years to launch my first business, to go to a place that nurtured me, that showed me mm -hmm. a vision of how to do this, is so super critical. And so if I can you know, provide the bridge to give people that possibility and recognize that even if you're doing this in your 30s, because that's what the age I started my first business, it's possible. Mm -hmm. And it's still just as rewarding. Yeah. And I love that that keeps going. You could be in your 40s. 50s, 60s. 60s. I'm going to say 70s as well. Oh, With yeah. the new neuro, you guys are into neuroscience, and we heard pieces of even med tech, things that are possible. Mm -hmm. And so future is bright. I know that quite a few of us want to know what is next for Kim Folson. Oh, my gosh. Well, so um, unlike my six ventures, which were the I'm partnered with a big equity person. I've got this big exit. No, we are building a Goldman Sachs platform to help fund and grow diverse businesses. Mm -hmm. Because like so many things, it takes a while. We're solving a multi-generational problem mm -hmm. that right now people do not think is a big, huge opportunity. But look at how much you know, the changing dynamics of our world are happening. And so while right now, you know, we've prioritized this, but we've amplified this mm -hmm. too. We produce a quarterly market report that that showcases the progress of our companies. We have had for our second year now um, a number of our companies make it to the Inc. 5000. And so uh, that is wow. the exciting work that we're looking to do. And someday, you know, in 10 years or so, people will say, oh my gosh, you know, it's not so rare that, you know, businesses that are not the next, you know, SpaceX or Tesla can add so much, but they do to so many communities. And that there's a shared, understood, a predictable way that you can go and be able to add value. Well, thank you for the value that you add. Thank you for the impact you've had, not just on the community, but on us. And thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Can you guys join me? Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Can we get another round of applause for Kim and Deborah? And while we are applauding, may I please acknowledge uh, Jay Brewster, our provost of Uni uh, Pepperdine University, is here, a big supporter of our <laughs> program. Thank you, Jay, for attending this program. And now I have a very special announcement. 
We are so impressed by all the founding teams here today. And as list winners, they have become a special part of our family here at Gradzidio. I am pleased to share that every most fundable company presenting here has been awarded a $25,000 scholarship toward a Gradzidio program. And our, our enrollment team has a table outside, just outside a patio. I wouldn't do my job if I didn't do a little pitch for Pepperdine. Um, talk to them. Um, they're very, very helpful in finding the right program for any of you. And now, finally, it is time that we've all been waiting for. We're unveiling the 2022 Most Fundable Companies list winners. Companies will be announced by category level, starting with bronze, and will work our way up to platinum. Announcing the bronze category winners, I invite IP donors Jim Kasperi and Elliot Reeve of the Venture Alliance to the podium. They're also a platinum sponsor and serve on the Most Fundable Companies Advisory Council. Founders, as your company is announced, please have one person come up to the front of the auditorium to receive your award and be photographed. I'd also like to call Craig Edward, Amy Wood, Dean Crown, Shelley Miles, and Kilp Folsom in the area of the photos. Okay. Drum roll, um, please. Yes. Yeah. We, okay. have, we have four bronze winners, and we're going to be announcing them in alphabetical order. And the first winner in the bronze category is Bridge Therapeutics. You deserve it, if for nothing else, the way you managed your slides. Bear with us, please. We need to take our photo opportunity over here. Okay. And the second winner in the bronze category is Nico Tech. And if I can ask all the founders to kind of tee up over here on the right outside of the room so we can uh, more speedily come up to accept your awards. And the next bronze category winner is Uli Beauty. And the fourth and final winner in the bronze category is Vibe LLC, Glow Pals. How about another round of applause for the bronze winners?
And now announcing the silver category winners, I invite Gary Wamadama, the CEO and founder of CFO Plans, Platinum Sponsor and Pepperdine Grad City alumnus to the podium. Hi everyone. So the uh, silver category, the uh, first company, first winner is Circle Optics. The second winner is Gravy Stack. Silver category, uh, third winner, Lively Root Therapeutics. Sorry, Lively, um, excuse me, Lively Root Technologies. <laughs> Uh, fourth winner, silver category, Nanocan Therapeutics. The uh, silver category fifth winner, Veloce Energy. Thank you, Gary. And now announcing the gold category winners, I invite Bill Lang of the Grad Studio Foundation, our legacy sponsor and most fundable company advisory council member to the podium. Bill. Thank you, Clement. All right. The first winner is Corvera Surgical. And our second gold winner is Knee Voice. Our third gold winner is Trubify.
And our final gold winner is Omnivis. And then finally, announcing the Platinum category winners, I invite Shelley Miles, CEO of the Singleton Foundation for Financial Literacy and Entrepreneurship, our title sponsor, to the podium. Shelley. Oh my God, we're right at the end. How exciting. Okay, so the first company in the Platinum category is EarthGrid. I'm sorry about that. Um, quick shameless plug, I saw so many great presentations. Some of them mentioned fundraising on platforms. I'm super proud of the hard work and uh, continued good efforts that the team at EarthGrid are doing. And we look forward to hosting them on the Net Capital platform. Keep an eye out for it, thank you. <laughs> Okay, and the next platinum honoree is Genesis Systems. And the last platinum winner is One Health Group. Okay, another big hand for our winners. So alrighty then, the uh, 2022 Pepperdine Grazie Dio uh, Business School Most Fundable Companies Showcase event is now concluded. Congratulations to the winners. Everybody remember to go online and vote for your favorites now through October 24th. Uh, thank you again to our online audience across the world. And uh, that concludes the live stream, so it should have already said